education evolves as it tries to adapt to the changes happening in our world. Education holds communities together. As one community, we must work side by side in ensuring that education is relevant and responsive to the pressing problems that we are facing. Poverty, inequality, climate change, and disasters, and to the opportunities of the knowledge, information, and technological age. The Department of Education is committed to ensuring that every learner has access to quality basic education. It has always been and will always be true to its promise that no learner will be left behind. But with the rapid changes of today and the challenges of tomorrow, we must be ready. More than ever, it is necessary to take action amid the issues we are facing, to respond to the need for futures thinking and education, and for readiness to confront the rapid changes, challenges, and opportunities of the future, the Department of Education has initiated the Education Futures Program. The Education Futures Program should serve as an innovation center. It will provide the department the means to develop policies and programs that consider driving forces and possibilities beyond those that are currently implemented. The Education Futures Program will dive deep as it formulates solutions to the pressing problems. As a forward-looking unit, it is not constrained by the task of finding short-term solutions. Instead, it aims to create long-term solutions that will prepare us for different possible futures. As we strive towards ensuring quality education for all, learners will always be our top priority. The Education Futures Program will delve into our education system's complexities and look at them from newer perspectives. In doing so, the Education Futures Program aims to produce solution-driven learners and teachers equipped with the right skills and the right mindset that the future needs. This is the Education Futures Program, preparing for the possible futures. COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented changes to our usual ways of living. But the Department of Education remains unfazed by these challenges to fulfill the mission of Sulong Edo Kalidad, the rallying call for a national effort to deliver quality basic education to all Filipinos, which involved aggressive reforms in the four key areas. The K-12 curriculum review and update, improving the learning environment, Teachers of skilling and reskilling, an engagement of stakeholders for support and collaboration to move forward together as we prepare the education system for the future. The call for Sulong Edukalidad will continue, and we have built the framework of the Basic Education Learning Continuity Plan or the BELCP to put the needs of the learners at top priority. DepEd's BELCP is the major response and commitment to protect the health, safety, and well-being of learners, teachers, and personnel. The plan aims to provide opportunities to continue education even in these trying times. With a BELCP in place, supported by unprecedented number of diverse stakeholders from the academe, media, industry groups, NGOs, business and private individuals, Sulong Edo Kalidad will be able to sustain the aims in its reform for quality basic education. In our journey towards quality education, we have established the four pillars of aggressive reforms from the start and we have been continuing to progress in these pillars. In improving the learning environment, took action in the construction and rehabilitation of school buildings, ensured the availability of learning materials and equipment, and prioritized our last mile schools. 
the challenges of the pandemic also brought to light the urgent need to upgrade our ICT infrastructure to service the needs of education. In terms of the teachers of skilling and reskilling, we were able to establish more innovative professional standards for teachers and school heads. We have aligned the professional development of teachers with their career progression to track their development as part of the National Educators Academy of the Philippines Transformation. With the launch of the Education Futures Program, where we will be focusing on innovative actions and solutions to improve the state of our education, we are now more than ready to start a new journey and continue our fight for quality education for all Filipino learners. Finally, we've given high importance to the engagement of stakeholders for support and collaboration. In support of this, we have convened the Philippine Forum for Accessible Quality Basic Education or the Education Forum, which will leverage other partnerships for education quality and strengthen partnership with the Philippine Normal University as the country's national center for teacher education. The department has also been developing a professional development program for teachers and school leaders in order to equip them with the skills, materials, and data that will allow them to help their students prepare for PISA 2022. This intervention consists of the following components. Online training for teachers and school leaders, development of learning materials and practice tests for students, deepening the analysis of the PISA 2018 results, and supporting school-level action research. Now that the year is about to end, our commitment to Sulong Edukalidad will continue and will be far from being gone. With a lot at stake, considering our new knowledge and experience from this year's challenges, we are equipped to face a new future. As we head on to the future where we will face many challenges and uncertainties, the department will always be the guardian of every Filipino learner's right to education. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very important and timely virtual public forum on the education sector. One of the most extensive and comprehensive assessments of the Philippine education sector ever conducted was that of the Congressional Commission of Education, or the EDCOM, of 1991. Three decades after the EDCOM of 1991, the question we ask today is, how close are we to achieving the goals and objectives set in the EDCOM report. As we continue the process of assessment and reform in the education sector, the Center for Leadership, Citizenship, and Democracy, or CLCD, of the National College of Public Administration and Governance, NCPAG, in the University of the Philippines, Deleman, and the Social Watch Philippines, in partnership with the Philippine Society for Public Administration, Junior Philippine Society for Public Administration, and the Education Futures Program, We'll take a look back at the 1991 EDCOM report and the current status of the reforms that it ushered in through this virtual public forum entitled Revisiting the EDCOM of 1991, Continuities and Discontinuities in Philippine Education Sector Reform. And before we continue our discussion about the EDCOM report and the education sector, may please request everyone to please stand for the singing of our national anthem.
kababayan ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Yes, uh, thank you very much. You may now all be seated. Good afternoon again to everyone. Magandang magandang hapon po sa lahat ng more than roughly 1,000 uh, Zoom participants at syempre sa mga nanonood po sa ating Facebook Live. Um, again, welcome to this very important uh, virtual public forum entitled Revisiting the EDCOM of 1991, Continuities and Discontinuities in Philippine Education Sector Reform. Um, sana po um, okay po tayong lahat. I hope we're all safe and healthy. My name is Lester Balmatero. I'll be your host for today. I am a technical staff at the Center for Leadership, Citizenship, Democracy at uh, UPNC PAG, and I'm also the national president of the Junior Philippine Society for Public Administration. All right, wag na po nating patagalin pa. No? At this point, we will now hear from the team who will present the findings of the Education Commission Report of 1991. So allow me to introduce our presenters. The team is headed by a professor and former dean of UPNC PAG, Dr. Alex V. Berlantes Jr. Our second presenter is an assistant professor and the director of the Center for Leadership, Citizenship, and Democracy, UPNC PAG, Professor Herzadel P. Flores. Our third presenter is a university extension specialist, UPNC PAG CLCD, Ms. Melanie G. Riva. And our fourth and final presenter is a University Research Associate, UPNC PAG CLCD, Mr. John Robert M. Melendres. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our presenters a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much, uh, Lester. Uh, what a privilege to be with all of you today, but even before I start, since I'm the first speaker, uh, not necessarily in accordance with importance, but we certainly would like to acknowledge our very important guests today who are with us today. But even before I do that, uh, I'd like to congratulate you, Lester. He's the national president of the Junior Society of Public Administration, and he just graduated, actually. He was the uh, valedictorian, if you may. He, he delivered the valedictorian address for the graduates of uh, public that he graduated uh, uh, cum laude, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, where he got his MPA. Uh, uh, is public. Congratulations, Lester. So I'd like to begin by, of course, um, greeting our dear Secretary Leonor Briones, ma'am. Um, thank you for this opportunity and privilege to be part of this, uh, this forum. I know that uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Prospero de Vera is also with us. Uh, he himself used to be the head of the CLCD that's sponsoring this. So it's good to see you, uh, Sir Popoy. And of course, uh, ma'am Rosalinda Constantina of the TESDAT and uh, representing, of course, Sir Sir La Pena, 
And of course, uh, I know that uh, Senator Sherwin Gachalian is with us also today. And of course, uh, Sen uh, Congressman uh, Romulo and our colleagues, uh, Sir Rene Raya, um, Sir Marco de los Reyes of, of PIBED, uh, Sir Rene Raya is the, the convener of Social Watch, uh, co-convener of course of our today's forum. And uh, later on, or if she's not with us, uh, she, she might still be with us, um, Mam Nene Guevara of uh, Sinergia and a good friend from our Galing Puok days. Uh, see, Ma'am Flora Arellano, I've had the privilege of meeting you over the past technical uh, uh, working groups, Ma'am. It's such a pleasure to see you and work with you now, Ma'am. Of course, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah San Fernando of the Freedom From Debt Coalition. And together with us, of course, is my Dean, uh, Professor Dan Sagil, and uh, my colleagues at the College of Public Ad, uh, Dr. Reggio Gaddan, and of course, Dr. Maria Victoria Rakisa, who is also the convener of Social Watch. I'm working with uh, four of my colleagues. I'm very happy to be with them. Sir uh, uh, Elisadel Flores, as mentioned, he's the director of the Center for Local, uh, of, the, <laughs> of our uh, CLCD, Center for Leadership and, and uh, Citizenship Democracy. And with Ms. Melanie Riva, very bright student. Um, actually, she teaches with us and she's finishing her doctorate with, with, with uh, uh, UP. And of course, Jan Melendres, another very bright, uh, very bright researcher from CLCD. Okay, so uh, uh, it's a very interesting title, Po, uh, that uh, we talk about uh, 100 years of solicitude, and uh, that was actually coined by uh, Sir uh, Elisa Del Flores, taking off from what Gabriel, Mar uh, Gabriel Marquez thought, 100, 100 years of soli solitude. Point, we're talking about EDCOM, we're talking about education, and over a hundred, or quite, it's about 100 years where the first major study on education in the Philippines was published, the uh, Monroe Report. So 100 years of self-reflection, 100 years of, uh, of uh, 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 reflecting and analyzing education through the years. And Melanie Riva, as I mentioned, uh, we, we talked about this also, uh, called me, told me that, hey, we're talking also about continuous and discontinuities. Actually, it's a very nice point because when we were, when we were framing this, uh, yes, if you look at the history of education, Maraming nagtutuloy, but there are also good continuities. Hence, that's the title that we, we decided to uh, uh, put into our, our paper. And of course, Elsie uh, uh, Rockwell talked about the importance of delving into the past to understand the present. And of course, we Filipinos are, of course, aware na about our salawikain, salawikain, ang hindi lumingon sa pinanggalingan ay hindi, maka, ma, hindi makakarating sa paroroanan. We mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, this really part of a bigger effort on the Education Futures Unit of the Department of Education. And we're extremely privileged to be part of this. And our counterparts, of course, the whom we report to really is uh, si Josh Deldelao, Ma'am Catherine Yuping, Ma'am Aya Nalino, Vincent Sabong, and of course, uh, Professor Cheryl Lynn Monterola, who's also a professor at the department, at the, at the, at the uh, College of Education. 100 years of solicitude. So part of what we did, Po, is really reviewing. Of course, our main TOR is the EDCOM report. I have tons and tons of books about the EDCOM report, volumes over uh, 3,000 pages, Po. But we look at that, but very, very important, Po, we put the appropriate context, if you may. No? And, uh, so the, the EDCOM report had four, four books, 11 volumes. And of course, we look at several legal issuances. But over and above that, as part of the uh, effort to help in the futures thinking, uh, education futures of DepEd. We participated in a number of KIIs, dialogues, conversations, futures thinking, development academy in the Philippines, of course, Senator Pia Cayetano herself. You know? And we have joined a number of, of uh, TWG SPO, including the oversight, uh, uh, um, um, participated in meetings, of course, as observers or even as quote unquote resource persons, including you know, the Committee on Basic Education headed by uh, Congressman Romulo. Who, will, who is with us. Uh, so good to see you, Congressman Romulo. I still remember when we were working together in CHED in those different uh, different uh, board meetings. And of course, Congressman Mark Go, you know, uh, my own congressman since I'm from Baguio. And of course, in the TWG, maraming salamat, of course, headed no less by Senator Winga Chalan and the very, very uh, kind support of Attorney Hazel Villarba. Point. This is really part of a broader study, but as pointed out by, by Mambrians, let's look at what we have. And obviously, one of the biggest studies over the past years is the EDCOM report. Alam mo ninyo, when we look at EDCOM, of course, I've seen this before, but not as deep as we did today. 
one very one very important uh, part of it is they talk about uh, no, 1991. Pero alam po ninyo, 1991, the EDCOM report was uh, written and published. Guess what? They were already talking about 2020. And we are here today, 2020. I would not say serendipitously, but 20 years later, we are now looking at what the EDCOM report wanted us to have 20, uh, 30 years later, not 20 years, 30, 1991, to, okay, 30 years later. And they had a vision, a clear philosophy of education, acquisition by every Filipino, 12 years old about universal education, then quality education for all, education that's proactive, a coordinated balanced life, and nationalist education. Point, that was their vision in, 20, in 1991. It's 2020, and it's indeed time for us to take a look at that again. And I think part of the report that that was, of course, we are doing today is really where are we today as far as is concerned? EDCOM 1991 was created, joint res resolution similar to what, but it was just a 12 month national review, national review and assessment of Philippine education and manpower. Okay, and uh, 12 month report, a uh, uh, 12 month national review uh, and uh, education. And it was composed of Senator Angara, of course. Uh, in UP, we used to call him Peja, Seja, Peja, of course. You know? And he was the chair. And of course, Senator Enrile, Senator Herrera, and uh, Senator Laurel Gasol. And, and Congress, of course, Congressman Carlos Padilla. I've had the fortune also of working with him in the chairs of the board of, in, in a number of schools in Ched. And of course, uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Almario Raimundo, of course, uh, uh, Congressman Amatong, of course, uh, Congressman Escudero, and uh, Senate, uh, Congressman Montejo. EDCOM won. So they conducted lots of work, public hearings in 18 regions po, uh, and uh, 13 regional centers, with 33 groups, private schools, invited 378 experts, and all of their studies are with us. In fact, we, we, I'll, I'll talk about the new one, and studied and did a lot of consultations, a lot of work po. And of course, ito po yung naging output nila. No? Four books, uh, Book one, areas of concern for independent education, including teacher welfare, compensation benefits, governance management, the educational ladder, basic education, consultative reports, including what the public perceive and provincial consultations and what the experts say, including uh, volume uh, uh, position papers and reports of educators and sectoral representatives, reports of consultants and experts in education. Point, it was highly consultative the way it was done. And really they look and at all the stakeholders, we look at the technical studies, and I think this is very, very useful. For those of you who are interested in this, I suggest you take a look at this very, very good technical studies or by, written by, of course, experts in education. Dean Cortez, you know, we were much young. Of course, Father Nebres, I'm very happy to see you, Father Nebres, uh, whom I've worked with in Gawad Kalinga. And of course, Father Nebres really uh, wrote the, the, the paper on philosophy of education, Dean Cortez, governance, etc., including Secretary Manny Alba. He was once at one point uh, um, DBM Secretary, Jose Ante. And dami po mga papers that have been written. I suggest it's really such a rich mind of beautiful, uh, powerful information contextualized in 1991, looking back. I think they look back up to 1970. Okay, more studies. There were technical studies. Then they had by Emmanuel Velasco towards the uh, Center for Leading Edge Technology, Academic Freedom, NAP Imperial, one of my best friends in life. We worked, I worked with him in, 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 in Ched for a long time, but we were together in Baguio City for a long time. Teachers' education, some issues, and uh, by uh, Dean, Dean Savellian. I say Dean because when I was with the uh, UP, I, was, uh, I, I also happened to be one of the RAs. And of course, I met my Dean Savellano, Dean Cortez, et cetera, et cetera. And a whole lot on teachers, education, teachers' compensation, the teaching of the future, financing education, et cetera. Ito po mga technical studies that they did. And a lot of position papers. Brother Rolly Deason, of course, he's passed on, but uh, we know Brother Rolly Deason. And these are all six papers on decentralization, the structure, two papers on governance and financing, uh, 11 papers on curriculum and degree program, and position papers for language instruction, six papers, higher professional education, research on research, special education, testing evaluation, teacher development, and teacher organization and the different sectors po, came up with technical studies. Point, very, very well studied point. In one year, they did a lot, a lot, a lot of work po. And of course, including technical studies, our libraries, linkages, ito, maganda po, it's come up uh, very, very much in the, in the recent discourse on, the, on academic industry linkages, okay? So health, et cetera. So EDCOM, uh, uh, the EDCOM report uh, stated, ito po, pang conclusion niya. The quality of Philippine education was in a state of decline, 1991. 
the quantum state was in the state of decline. Two principal reasons behind the decline, the country was not investing in, in education in the education system and establishment was poorly managed. That was the conclusion, okay? And we on ourselves, Kamipo, with Nell and Dell and Jan, and of course, with the help of Sir Josh, uh, we're, we're extremely grateful for your support, sir. Uh, we, we also looked at others. So we looked all the way down to 1925. Kaya nga doon sinulat po yung Monroe Report. 1925 hanggang ngayon po. And I'll talk about that very quickly in a while. Economic Survey Committee, 1927. Educational Survey, 1936. The President Commission to Survey Philippine Education, to making education work, basic education studies. And the, of course, the President Presidential Commission Education Reform, of the UNDP report of 2009, Education Outcomes in the Field. Napakarami po, including, of course, among others, and a great book uh, written by Mom uh, Mona Balisno. I, I remember meeting when I was still much younger. In fact, when I should said, she came and gave me the book herself. No? And then Roadmap to Higher Education, headed by, by the Commission of Higher Education. Uh, of course, where uh, Sir Popoy is now our chairperson, a uh, good friend and colleague from CLCD. Of course, he's not the chair, so he's our boss, chairman of the board of UP, Philippine Education for All, Mapping, etc. Hanggang po 2020, Del and I, uh, Professor Del and I, together with other colleagues, po, we were asked by uh, C, um, Ben Jokno, Sir Ben Jokno, uh, then the chair of the uh, uh, Secretary of Budget Management, to also come up with the right sizing study. Ang inassign po sa amin, education at saka local government. Because that's my other area of interest. So point dear friends, a lot of studies have been done. And what we did po as a, as a, as a team is we zeroed in on what were the major findings of the studies. And later on, I'll talk about the, the so-called uh, um, 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 uh, deep, deep, uh, deep seated challenges. Del Flores, he's really the, Del is really the, I guess the, uh, the poet in our group. So I talk about the deep seated challenges and the, but what did Edcom do? They looked at, they have na po silang solid, 12 legislative agenda, no? And this will be dis discussed by my colleague, si uh, Mel, Mel, Mel Riva later on. One by one, pa inisa isa po namin yan, ano ba yung pinopost na legislative agenda? Ano ba yung nangyari? Was it implemented or not implemented? And what we added po, what are the issues and concerns? Bringing it into current Philippine context. So 12 po yan. I won't go over that because isa-isahin po yan ni, ni, ma, ni Ma'am uh, Mel. Mamaya po, but they pertain, they pertain to governance, uh, the, the five areas that I'll talk. Then of course, there are five policy recommendations, eight policy recommendations that were that are to, going to be discussed by um, by uh, ma, 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 my good friend, Jan, Jan later on po. So ano nangyari? 20 years later, so Edcom. 20 years later, ano nangyari? May proposal nga po to form Edcom 2. Anong sinabi sa proposal ng EDCOM 2, which of course uh, introduced by Senator Angara, Senator Lillion, uh, Sir uh, Sherwin Gachalian. I'm very happy, sir, that you have uh, privileged us to be attending your TWGs, among others. Uh, uh, great, great point, of course, see Sir Joel Villanueva, whom, as you know, was used to be the head of, of TESDA, and uh, uh, I, I also worked with him, and I, I was with Chad, among others. Okay. So, anong sinabi po ng, ng, ng Senate Resolution number 20? Ito po. They, they talk about laws were passed in uh, EDCOM to try focalize the education. Okay, try focalize. That is a, ngayon tatlo, CHED, TESDA, and of course, DepEd. Try focalize. Ikalawa po, sinabi dito, the other recommendations were either not acted upon or implemented as EDCOM intended. And that's what we looked at po. And the third, creation of a national coordinating council. Ang pinakahugot po nito ay doon po sa coordinating council between the try focalized agencies. Something that has come up a number of times of course, within the context of governance. And of course, uh, just to put in a note here that EDCOM proposed actually the creation of a National Council for Education as an advisory body to both executive and legislative branches. Yung NCCE po that was referred to dito po sa, sa resolution was actually proposed later under the PCER, Presidential Commission on Education Reform, where DepEd, CHED, and TESTA were uh, members. Okay. So ito po nilagay dun, dun, dun sa resolution po. Whereas the system of basic education in the country still lags behind. Ito po yung parang naging wake-up call na naman natin. 30 years later, andyan pa ba tayo? Mukhang some of the problems 30 years later are still the same problems today. And that seems, that is the message actually of the Senate Resolution uh, number 10. Okay, So the proposed resolution talks about some of the reforms that had come based on in-depth study to improve were either not implemented, 
or not fully implemented. Therefore, they point out the need to strengthen coordination. The quality of education in the country remains high. The system of basic education behind still lacks behind. And of course, we are all familiar with the, with the PISA report. And of course, they talk about the, there is a need to, be, to adapt to the changes brought about by the ever-changing educational paradigms and international standards. I think that's a very, very important point and the degree of incapacity to be at par with other countries. So one eye to the uh, globe, to the rest of the world, one eye internally. I think that's important. And that's one particular message that our group uh, uh, are, are suggesting po. Of course, sa house naman po, there were also similar uh, resolution, bill number 27. They talk about limited improvements in national examination performance, national investments have not been translated, you budget, and uh, John will talk about that because if you recall, as I mentioned earlier, that, is one, that was one of the major uh, recommendations of EDCOM 1. So very important po, and we all know about the, the constitutional provision that the state shall give highest budgetary priority to education, and we talk about the long-standing infirmities in basic education system. This is from House Resolution. Long-standing infirmities, such as shortage of teachers, classrooms. We've seen this and this before. You know, sinabi po to ng House Resolution number 27, no? Leading to the proposal for EDCOM 2. Ang pinakahugot po nito, it seems like the, the problems have been already identified earlier by EDCOM 1 and this, uh, 30 years later, are they still the same? That's a ma ma major question that perhaps we as a group can continue debating or discussion. Of course, they talk about the fast changing educational patterns across the globe. So one eye to the rest of the world again. That's why Paul, one particular message that we talk about here is what we talk about globalization, globalization, thinking global, but not forgetting local. But it is important that we think global. Hey, come on guys, we're talking about PISA, we're talking about being compared rankings, et cetera, et cetera. And as, as the, uh, the, um, uh, the resolutions point out, mukhang nahi, nahiwan tayo. Okay. And then, of course, this is the Bologna Accord, Washington Accord, Dublin Accord, Sydney Accord. Uh, in Chad, we used to talk about that. Okay. At the House po, the same. They talk about some structural issues. Uh, Congressman uh, Romel Angara mentioned this, that uh, he talked about the main challenges. And of course, the, the, uh, Congressman Benitez talked about the trifocalized of system system of education needs to be re-examined. And that is also what Ma'am uh, Mona Balisno mentioned. It's a governance question. That's why po, we're talking about executive legislative. That was the law. And if ever, we have to look at this perhaps, this for the uh, legislative would come in, which is why there is this uh, proposal, if you may, uh, for the, for the uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, oversight, if you may, of uh, education. Okay. so. Uh, so there's now the pending legislative measure of EDCOM 2 joint resolution creating an oversight committee. So it's there, I already mentioned that, no? Uh, so EDCOM 1, 20, uh, 30 years ago, I, I, I should not say EDCOM 2, kasi hindi pa naman na, 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 ano. but EDCOM, I always put a question mark. And they talk about the same thing, improving the quality of instruction student in basic higher education should be the focus of education reforms. The impact, if you may, ito yung context, uh, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, I remember, uh, attending a forum at the University of Valenzuela with my good friend Mitch, uh, who, Mitch Wilber, who organized that very nice forum, Mitch, uh, in, uh, in uh, Valenzuela, when we talk of the fourth industrial revolution, okay, combined with climate change, things are rapidly changing. And looking back, hey, let's look back. Monroe Report, 1925. Anong sinabi ng Monroe? Teaching training facilities, because they, they, their task was to form a judgment of the Philippine educational system. Sam alam po din yun, 1925 po 1925, 100 years ago, a century ago, if you may. Teacher training facilities, professional training of teaching staff. Ito yung, yung sabi nila na, we have to work on those. Kulang ang facilities. A hundred years ago, can you imagine that? Monroe Report, adaptation of curriculum to the needs and abilities of individual pupils, and of course, 2008, ang sabi ng, ng uh, Human Development Report, the puzzle of Philippine education is a case in point. Puzzle. Uh, I don't know what it's Tagalog. But, uh, puzzle of Philippine education. Despite years of diagnosis, prognosis, and reform initiatives, Philippine education remains in crisis. The same issues, same issues, of access, equity, quality, relevancy today, were observed 83 years ago. No? And the problem of high drop outreach, low pupil program, poor teacher quality, in inappropriate language. Ito, inappropriate language. Nabanggitin po na yan. Learning, irrelevant training materials. Nabanggitin po yan. At nabanggitin sa Philippine Development Report. Parang alam na po natin. At ito nga ginamit ng, nila ng term. These have been discussed ad nauseum and answers to it are fairly known. We must ask why. 
despite the same fundamental diagnosis and recommendations by a slew of experts, including those I've mentioned earlier, fundamental issues in education have not been resolved. Somebody once said, is this paralysis by analysis? Okay. Anyway, so um, uh, Cynthia Po, uh, my good friend, a former commissioner, she's also the vice president of UP now. So um, from 1925, she, they and together with Dina, of course, herself, a former dean, and Alan Bernardo of uh, Philippine Society, they wrote a very good paper for that. They talk about same issues for a language of learning that is not attuned with scientific findings of cognition, irrelevant learning materials, excessive centralization, inadequate financial resources, and it's not really tiresome in their repetition. So the team, therefore, our team, focused on the heart of the EDCOM report. So more than 3,000 pages, several volumes. We said, what is it? So the EDCOM report po ay meron apat. Yung 12 legislative agenda at saka po yung eight policy recommendations na aking pag-uusapan po mamaya. And these were based on extensive review of the challenges in Philippine education earlier. So with that po, so ano yung, uh, uh, yung uh, I'm just front-ending some of our major findings po. And deep-seated educational reforms, institutional governance challenges, inadequate financial resources, challenges in HR of teachers and educators. Uh, no, somebody once called, uh, by the way, I, I know that Ma'am Ched uh, Arsadon is with us. You know, Ma'am, we, we used your very good paper when you did uh, an ethnographic study where you had about, what, 60,000 uh, members of that FB group. I mean, if you fast forward it, given this day and age of social media, 60,000 teachers. And if you look at that, po, they also articulated this concern. And thank you, Ma'am Ched, for that very, very important paper cited, of course, by, by, um, by um, our, our group, no, si Mel. Challenges in HRD of teachers. They repeat them, po, the so-called teacher factor, you know, inequitable access to, uh, to quality of education, responsiveness of the curriculum. So and po, governance, finance, uh, teachers, quality of education, curriculum. And isang hugot po nito, I would say, that's why we put a space there, the globalized and competitive uh, Philippine uh, first. And so, okay. So I will now, uh, so yun po. And of course, we related this to what we call the education perennials that was done, of course, by the group of Sir uh, Yusek Malalawan within the context of the Futures Program. So our study po, we see that. So I think I, I've used up my, my uh, uh, 20 minutes, uh, actually, that you gave me. So I will now, then I'll, I'll come back for later on to quote unquote uh, uh, zero in on the conclusion. So I will now uh, turn over the 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 floor, to, uh, the virtual floor, as I say to my friend, uh, Professor Del Flores Chapo, ang ano, director of the CLCD po, and he's also an expert in education. Sir Del, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brillantes, for that very kind introduction. Now, please allow me to give you a short background of our presentation this uh, afternoon. Our present study is actually a part of a broader technical assistance to the Education Futures Program of the Department of Education, or EDUC Futures. This component focuses on the review of major education sector assessments before and after the 1991 EDCOM report, starting with the Monroe Survey in 1925, to the UNDP's Philippine Human Development Report 2008-2009, which focused on institutions, politics, and human development, to the Department of Budget and Management's review of the mandate and functions of the education sector conducted in 2018 to 2019. In these reviews, we aim to accomplish two things. First, we wanted to have a picture of how close or far are we from the education sector goals embodied in these assessments, as well as in the long-term vision for education informed by the long-term aspirations of education stakeholders, especially the youth as articulated, of course, in the Ambition Natin 2040 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, or SDGs, to which we made our commitment. Beyond these sources, we hope that the studies and consultations of the Ed of Futures themselves can give us a better and clearer picture of what this long-term vision is. In fact, while we call our present study 100 Years of Solicitude, Continuities and Discontinuities in Philippine Education Sector Reform, we have as a working title for our next study, Philippine Education, a Century Hence. The current study, focusing more on the review of assessments of the Philippine education sector made by both foreign and Filipino scholars and organizations, borrowed its title from a foreigner, the late great Colombian Nobel Prize winning author, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. The next one, 
inspired by the Filipinas' vision for the future of our education, echoes our national hero and perhaps first futurist, Dr. Jose Rizal. Going back to our present study, its other aim is to draw knowledge and lessons from the review of the assessments, the successes and failures of past policies and programs that the Edoc Futures can make use of in its own studies, capacity building programs, and scenario planning. These are important for the Edoc Futures to be able to recommend strategic and effective basic education policies, the spot black swans, or what we call events that come as a surprise, but as a major effect, often negative, likely hindering much our capacity to achieve our set goals and objectives. An example, perhaps, may be the ongoing pandemic. And also black elephants, an amalgamation of the concepts of elephant in the room and the black swan that was mentioned earlier. Black elephants are there for something that should have been obvious but often ignored or overlooked until we are surprised that now we have to deal with its negative repercussions. An example is the rapid population growth that we had in the 1980s to the 2000s that now continue to put pressure on our education and health systems. Through the efforts of the EDOC Futures, our basic education sector should therefore be prepared to respond to black swans, black elephants, and other emerging strategic issues or ESIs, nascent issues with unclear trajectories or outcomes that could present new challenges or opportunities for the sector and our society in general, such as, of course, those that are brought by the knowledge economy and the fourth industrial revolution. Being prepared to address these issues, as well as the deep-seated challenges mentioned by Dr. Brillantes earlier, our education sector can now tackle the next order of business. How do we achieve our sectoral goals and targets? And how do our aspirations change through time? Understanding that in our present fast-paced society, our dreams and visions of the future may change with every new possibility or opportunity provided by our technology-driven world. Answering these important questions will allow our education agencies through continuous engagement and with the support of the education community and our citizens, come up with timely, sound, responsive, and inclusive education plans, policies, and programs that could lead to the achievement of our vision. We are cognizant, however, of the fact that this rosy picture should be contextualized in a Philippine education setting that is currently facing a major socioeconomic disruption brought about by the pandemic a dynamic socio-political environment rendered more complicated by social media, and now becoming more and more characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, or the wicked VUCA, rather than the clear trends and opportunities that we used to have before. All the more demanding an education sector that has a bold vision, profound understanding of its environment, and as clarity and agility or the good VUCA in its policies and programs. Now, let me turn you over to our colleague, Ms. Melanie Riva, to discuss our findings. Thank you very much, um, Director Flores. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'll start again with the insight um, pointed earlier by Professor Alex Brillantes. Um, it's from um, Elsie Rockwell, an education anthropologist, wherein he, she pointed out that um, reflecting on the works done is essential to the understanding of the continuities and discontinuities and um, this emphasizes that um, delving into the past helps us understand the present. So um, in this sense, um, to understand the intricacies of our education system, we look back into the history of how it has transformed from its unstructured origin into a structured a system, which is in fact an assimilation of the uh, hegemonic West. 
So again, um, um, as discussed earlier, uh, we look back as far as the Monroe survey done in 1925. And then we looked into the latest assessment reports of the status of our education system that uh, includes the right sizing studies of the um, Department of Budget and Management uh, done in 2020. So uh, um, we present to you the long, we, a while ago, uh, um, it was presented to you the long list of the uh, pre-EDCOM studies and the uh, post-EDCOM studies on um, Philippine education. So the major studies and assessments done before the EDCOM also served as the EDCOM 1991 team uh, takeoff and was also looked into by those who conducted the recent reviews and major assessments. And as mentioned, again, uh, in the report of Dr. Cynthia Bautista, Dr. Alan Bernardo, and former uh, DepEd Undersecretary D Dr. Dina Ocampo, um, entitled uh, uh, When Reforms Don't Transform, that it's long tradition of critical assessments and reform-oriented planning the type ed has actually incubated, tested, and proved the effectiveness of um, numerous reform initiatives, but notwithstanding the tremendous efforts, the quality of Philippine education continue to decline. Now, equally important, or um, shall I say more important than achieving a world-class education is the future of our children and youth, our learners. To borrow the words from um, DepEd Secretary uh, Briones, the future of education is not ranking, although ranking in international assessments is useful because we see ourselves to the mirror of global standards. But challenges that confront Philippine education must be faced not for the sake of getting to the top, but to prepare our learners for the present and um, for the future. So um, given the chronic illness of a deteriorating quality of um, Philippine education, we go back to the most intensive study done on education sector, the EDCOM 1991. And we traced the outcomes of its recommendations, particularly that of the 12 legislative agenda and the eight policy recommendations. Out of the 12 legislative agenda, four of which was never enacted, although it can be noted that its aim has been or are now directly and indirectly reflected in most of the debt ed's policies and development plans, including that of the implementation of Republic Act uh, 10.533 or the Enhanced uh, Basic Education Act of 2013. The first um, legislative agenda now pertains to the concurrent resolution urging the then Department of Education, Culture and Sports to lengthen the school calendar from 185 days to 200 days, granting provincial superintendents the authority to determine the beginning and end of the school year, taking the peculiar circumstances of a given community. Now, said agenda was um, implemented three years ago after EDCOM submitted its report. The Republic Act uh, 7797 has mandated to lengthen the school year from 200 to not more than 220 class days. And also in response to the COVID-19 situation, our Republic Act 11480 was signed into law on July 17, 2020 to amend Section 3 of Republic Act 7797, mandating the Secretary of Education to recommend to the Chief Executive adjustments in the school calendar in times of um, emergency. But considering the length of school days, the data presented by the National Center of Education and the Economy is of relevance. According to NCEE, the best education systems in the world require students to be in school in between 175 and 220 days. Moreover, the variation suggests that the total number of school days, uh, school days per year is not a determining factor in student performance. That more important than the amount of time students spend in class is how that time is spent. Thus, the quality of instruction is a factor, particularly that the dramatic shift of schools from in-school instruction to remote learning has led to more challenging situations that concerns the elements of time, communication, process, technology, and um, lesson design. The next um, legislative agenda of EDCOM 1991 pertained to the quality of teaching profession wherein um, it recommended to upgrade its quality and to strengthen the regulations governing the practice of teaching in the Philippines and prescribing and licensure examination. So now we now have the um, Professionalization, Professionalization Act of Teachers of 1994 
as is stipulated in Republic Act 7836, the same law that created the board for professional teachers under the supervision and control of the Professional Regulation Commission or PRC. Eventually, the professional board for teachers was uh, replaced with the licensure examination for teachers or um, the LED. Now, some of the concerns and issues relating to this are the emerging need to review or evaluate the content of LED. That it is high time to review its content in terms of its relevance to the K-12 curriculum, human development, and globalization. I need to consider an alternative assessment of pre teachers other than the national assessment is also of utmost importance. For example, the need to provide new teacher graduates the opportunity to practice their profession prior to, the, uh, for, prior to taking the licensure uh, exam and also to consider in the assessment their performances while in the field. Concern that relates to the quality of the teaching profession is the proliferation of private training entities that provide the continuing professional education or credit units or the CPE. The required CPE, the Continuing Professional Development Act of 2016 or the Republic Act 10.9.12, wherein PRC is mandated to implement professional form of trainings provided by PRC accredited CPD providers and through continuing education. Um, Section 5 of our Republic Act 10, 9, 12, the nature of uh, CPD programs so that um, they would be able to renew their license. Now, in addition to that concern, um, master's and um, doctoral units taken from teacher education institutions are not considered or recognized by PRC as CPD units. Now, this is based from the personal experience of the presenter way back in 2019, wherein her 33 units from an ongoing PhD program at the UP College of Education was not accepted while in the process of renewing her license. Said experience wherein the units earned from formal learning was opposed to what is expected as in section three of the CPD Act of 2016, now pertaining to the nature of CPD programs, which consist of structured and unstructured activities which have learning processes and outcomes. That said activities shall include but not limited to formal learning, non-formal learning, informal learning, self-directed learning, online learning activities, and professional work experience. So that formal learning as defined in the act refers to educational arrangements such as curricular qualifications and teaching learning requirements that takes place in education and training institutions recognized by relevant national authorities and which lead to diplomas and qualifications. Now, going now to the uh, next aid, uh, EDCOM 1991 uh, legislative agenda, this pertains to the act of upgrading the minimum salary grade level of qualified teachers in the elementary and secondary levels from salary grade, salary grade 10 to 17. Um, this EDCOM recommendation was drawn back, was drawn from the lack of implementation of the Magna Carta for public school teachers um, or the Republic Act uh, 4670. In particular, the sections 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19 of the said law. The Magna Carta for teachers of 1966 provides the public school teachers their professional rights and security. But we are all aware that the said law was partially implemented and which now exhibits weaknesses that hamper the improvement of the social and economic status, as well as the working conditions of public school teachers. There are proposals, there were propo uh, proposals in the past was um, like to upgrade teacher salaries, like the Senate bill number 69 was introduced on June 30, 2007. House Bill 3676 introduced on August 8, 2019, and another bill was recently passed. The Senate Bill Number 178 aimed for the same purpose of increasing uh, the teacher's salary. So the teacher's salary was increased um, following the final tranche of uh, the Salary Standardization Act of 2019, the Republic Act 11466. Um, the basic were in the basic monthly salary of teacher one under SG salary grade 11 was raised to 20,754 in 2019, 
per Dep Ed Executive Order Number Two O One. So that's from um, nine thousand four hundred sixty-six under salary grade and way back in two thousand. But however, in comparison with other qualified professionals under government service, um, the salary increase for teachers was not enough. Teacher sentiments relating to the lack of implementation of laws that concerns their welfare cannot be ignored. Teachers of today are audited based on competencies and their lives and works are reduced to numbers as, as reflected on the PBB mechanism, citing uh, Professor Chad Arsadon of the UP College of Education. Teachers are urging the government to implement the supposed honoraria for teaching overload or overtime pay to correct the current implementation of the social hardship allowance or the SHA that was based at present on a DBM circular providing teachers with maximum amount not exceeding 25% of a teacher's salary, which is contrary to Magna Carta's mandate, Section 19 pertaining to special hardship allowances, is stating that SHA shall be 25% at the minimum. And the salary increase after retirement Section 26 of, Mag of Magna Carta was also never implemented. Now, the teacher's heavy workload was often associated with their compliance to the results-based performance management system, systems or the RPMS. But of course, as, uh, as a COVID-19 measure, a memorandum order from Under Secretary for Curriculum and Instruction, just, uh, USEC, Eustad San Antonio, um, uh, he released on October 30, 2020, a memorandum to ease the academic burden. It outlined 10 highly recommended measures to field units to ensure flexibility in teaching and learning. And the policy was uh, also in response to the request of teachers and student groups to ease the components of distance learning um, implementation. Now, the EDCOM's, EDCOM reports, Chapter 5, uh, page 24, recognized that teaching is perceived as a poorly esteemed profession that the go and that the government has done little thing, uh, little to change the perception. Edcom reported that the government's indifference to, teacher, to teachers is reflected in the numerous non-teaching assignments, low salaries, non-payment of or irregular payment of benefits, meager opportunities for professional development, weak system of classroom supervision, lack of well-defined career path, and clear reward system and the lack of support to organized efforts to improve teachers at condition. Also in her ethnographic study of teachers, a professor from the UP College of Education, uh, Professor Asadon pointed out that since the logic of intellectually inferior teachers was only deflected and remained unchallenged, teachers remained uh, vulnerable to continuing a projection of intense work, poor compensation and constant scrutiny. And in relation to teachers' sentiments and lamentations about their deprived benefits and welfare, I included a line from a famous uh, movie, Moses, many that may provide us better insights that the strong make many, the weak make few, the, de the dead make none, and so much for accusations. Then um, the next um, legislative ag uh, agenda, again, concerning the teachers, was an act to strengthen teacher education in the Philippines by establishing teachers of excellence, appropriating funds thereof. So that um, Republic Act 7784, or the Act to Strengthen te uh, Teacher Education in the Philippines by establishing centers of excellence was signed into law on July 26, 1993. This law also created the, um, the Teacher Education Council. As overseer of higher education, um, the Commission on Higher Education, or CHED, manages the free teacher education program, along with the Teacher Education Council. So the TEC is mandated to um, identify and designate among existing private and public schools, teacher education institutions as centers of excellence for teacher education at the national, regional, provincial levels, and to initiate a periodic review of curricula and programs for teacher education and training through participatory methods such as self-assessment by institutions. The Commission on Higher Education Chairperson serves as an ex officio member of the Council and um, serving also as the chair of the strengthened TEC's Pre-Service Teacher Education Committee. Now, based on CHED's uh, May 2016 uh, report, um, there are 32 centers of excellence for teacher education, 19 private HEIs, and 13 I'm sorry, public HEIs. And 
we have 33 centers of development um, for teachers uh, education, 17 for private HEIs, and uh, 16 public HEIs. And, uh, and as of May 8, 2018, we have a total of 34 centers of excellence on teacher education and a total of 38 centers of development on teacher education. Now, what may be lacking, as suggested by um, some researchers from the College of Education, Tarlac City University, is, then, is a need to review the COEs and CODs in terms of their performance in the licensure examination for teachers, and also to look into the percentage number of their pre-service teachers who pursued, who actually pursued teaching after graduation. And another suggestion from a distinguished senator who recently filed the Senate Bill number 1887 to reform the Teacher Education Council is that the, select, is that the selection process of teacher education um, COEs and CODs should be done proactively. Next, agenda, um, next legislative, uh, legislative agenda concerns the children from zero to six, which is um, the act in institutionalizing early childhood in development centers for children aged zero to six, creating the implementing machinery thereof, providing guidelines, incentives, government financial support, and technical assistance and for other purposes. Thus, the Early Childhood Care and Development, or the EECD Act, or the Republic Act 8980, was signed into law on December 2000, nine years after EDCOM's recommendation. The ACCD Council, uh, through Republic uh, 1041, became the government agency mandated to implement the ACCD Act, supporting government programs that covers health, nutrition, early education and social services for children ages zero to four years. In addition, the council is also responsible in developing policies and programs, providing technical assistance and support to ECCD service providers, and it monitors ECCD service benefits and outcomes. The ECCD law is a very significant policy step to provide the mechanisms to integrate and harmonize multi-sectoral ECCD initiatives. However, the pressing concerns are, are, are still, press, uh, are still uh, being combated by the country. Poor nutrition, limited early education, and our lack of appropriate psychosocial care and stimulation, inadequate protection of Filipino children, especially those below four years of age. The Philippines ranks ninth in the world for having the most stunted children, those too short for their age. One in three Filipino ch children is stunted. In, in total, around 3.6 million or nearly 30% of Filipino children under five years old are stunted. Now, this is uh, th that data is based from um, UNICEF press release in 2019. So government policies, uh, by the way, poor nutrition, and its effects can be long lasting. It delays both body and brain development. So therefore it affects the children's school performance and eventually their future careers. Now government policies at the national and local levels are central to the promotion, protection and implementation of sound food and nutrition concepts in the Philippines. According to the 2015 National Nutrition Survey, persistent malnutrition problems such as protein energy malnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies such as uh, anemia, per, uh, vitamin A deficiency, and iodine deficiency disorders continue to afflict a major proportion of Filipinos. In the Philippines, a nutrition education and promotion date back as early, dates back as early as 1900 with a conduct of educational campaigns directed towards the prevention and control of epidemic dis uh, diseases and to the care of feeding of young infants, but much is still to be done to achieve zero hunger and zero malnutrition in the Philippines. In addition to that, the most vulnerable group of our population, the children, cannot escape the effects brought by climate change and this impact of the tiny virus called, called COVID-19 that disrupted the world in our very society and which humbled the human race and ignited a development emergency. Then, um, a concurrent solution in joining the Department of Education, Culture, and Sports to derive, sustain, or adapt certain non-traditional 
but cost-effective economical modes of, in, of instruction in, in both formal and non-formal education programs and designating the, the Under Secretary of Education for programs to oversee and monitor the effective implementation is, uh, was also on the list of the EDCOM 1991 recommendations. Although this was not enacted, it is reflected within the implementation of inclusion programs of the Department of Education, specifically the alternative delivery modes or the ADM being practiced along with the, the, along with the department's alternative learning system or ALS. The ALS non-formal education happens outside the classroom, community-based, usually conducted at community learning centers, barangay multi-purpose hall, libraries, or at home, managed by ALS learning facilitators such, such as mobile teachers, district ALS coordinators, instructional managers, and at an agreed schedule and venue between the learners and facilitators. The Senate Bill 1365, or the proposed alternative learning system, Act seeks to institutionalize an, an alternative learning system in every city and municipality across the country was already approved by the Senate during its third and final reading with a vote of 22-0. And under the proposed measure, lessons will be done at the designated community learning centers in cities and towns. This bill will allow the DepEd to utilize appropriate learning modes such as modular instruction, digital learning, face-to-face -face sessions, radio and or television-based instructions and workshop. Also just recently, the, the Department of Budget and Management, DBM, has approved the creation of 2,000 new teacher one for ALS with a salary grade of 11 or 20,179 monthly gross salary. Furthermore, as a COVID uh, measure, the DepEd has provided printed format or, of self-learning modules or so-called SLM, SLM with the alternative learning delivery mode for Filipino uh, learners across the country. This integration of SLM with the alternative learning delivery uh, modalities like um, television, radio-based instruction, blended and online will help ensure that all learners have access to quality basic education with face-to-face -face classes while face-to-face while -face classes uh, is still prohibited due to the public health um, situation. Now, um, this, um, the following uh, legislative agenda was, um, in fact, never enacted despite the, uh, um, the several uh, Senate proposals, specifically for legis uh, legislative agenda nine, uh, which, pertains to the con uh, which pertains to the creation of uh, the Center for Leading Edge Educational Technology. But um, the legislative agenda, um, pertaining to the conversion of secondary high schools into general high school is already uh, reflected on the implementation of the Republic Act 10533 or the Enhanced Basic Education Act of 2013 that created the junior high school and the specialized high school system, which is, uh, of course, the senior high schools. Now, um, three years after the recommendation of the EDCOM 1991, Book 1, Volume 4, Governance Pertaining to Governance and Management, the TESTA and CHED was established through the passage of Republic Act 7796 and Republic Act 7722, respectively. And along with the Department of Education, it created the so-called trifocal system of our education sector. The then Department of Education, Culture and Sports, which is now the, Dep the Department of Education, was focused on its mandate to manage the basic education, both uh, formal and non-formal. The DESTA to oversee the technical vocational skills development in the country and the CHED was to administer tertiary education, including pre-service um, teacher education. Um, DESTA became the fusion of uh, the National Manpower Youth Council of uh, the Department of Labor and Employment, the Bureau of Technical and Vocational Education of DEX, and the Apprentice Program of the Bureau of Local Employment, as recommended by EDCOM in 1991. The merging of these offices was meant to reduce overlapping in skills development activities initiated by various public and private sector agencies and to provide direction to the country's technical vocational training or TVET system. TESTA's important role related to teacher training development is the establishment of the Philippine Tibet Trainers Qualifications uh, Framework, the PTTQF, in 2006. 
uh, that serve as a guide in the development and, re and recognition of qualification of qualifications of trainees in the Tibet sector. The TESDA is also member of the Curriculum Consultative Committee as identified in Section 6 of Republic Act 10.533 or the Enhanced Basic Education Act of 2013. TESDA is committed to contribute to the continuing implementation of the K-12 program through the, through the DepEd's Technical Vocational Livelihood, TVL, specialization track for the senior high school level. Now, the Commission on Higher Education, as the primary agency to manage teacher education, recognizes the changing education landscape as it is shaped by international forces, such as the ASEAN Community for the ASEAN Qualifications Reference Framework, the 21st Century Learning Framework, the K-12 curriculum, the, in, the Industry 4.0 used interchangeably with the fourth industrial revolution, and which represents a new stage in the organization and control of the industrial value chain. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, and of course, the internationalization of higher education and global mobility. The outcomes-based education, or OBE, is also a curriculum framework um, used by the, Depart by the Commission on, on Higher Education that outlines specific measurable outcomes. The standards included in the frameworks are usually chosen through the area's normal political process. It entails a commitment not only to provide an opportunity of education, but also to require learning outcomes for advancement. Now, along with the CHED, the Teacher Education Council functions to oversee the quality of pre-service teacher education. The text serves as a, me a mechanism to facilitate the collaboration between the pre-service process in teacher education institutions and including the in-service processes in both public and private. Now, the establishment of the Commission on, on, on Higher Education necessarily transferred administration of pre-service teacher education to the, to the CHED. As such, the Department of Education, the major consumer of pre-service teachers, relies on CHED for the quality of teachers as producer of teacher education graduates. The Teacher Education Council functions to bridge this gap, but the, but the Secretary of the Department of Education has identified this educational gap on teacher curriculum as I call for the Department of Education to know how universities and colleges train education majors. Secretary Leonor Briones advocates to strengthen the link between the pre-service and the in-service teachers. The same issue was also raised by Senator Awin Gatchalian, the chairman of Senate Committee on Basic Education, Arts and Culture, wherein he emphasized that there is a strong disconnection between the CHED, the agency head for producing teachers, and DepEd as the consumer and end user of education graduates. Now, while the trifocalization of the education sector into DEX, CHED, and TESDA has allowed the departments concerned accordingly to focus more sharply on the respective mandates, over time, however, a growing need has been felt for greater coordination among departments that despite the existence of the three education agencies, problems in Philippine education system are still persistent. To borrow the words from former Secretary of Education, Dr. Mona Dumlao Valisno, when education agencies was, were trifocalized in 1994, it was filled with the best intentions, that of giving focus on each of the education subsectors to ultimately improve education quality. Lately, the three bodies mentioned have been meeting informally to address concerns that have surfaced like possibilities of overlapping, duplicating disjoint plans and policies, priorities and concerns as the case may be. Further, Dr. Balisno observed that since the implementation of the trifocal system, the question of what happened during the process remained the same as the deterioration of the quality of Philippine education persisted over the years as reflected by the proliferation of fly-by-night institutions aerofield textbooks and module certification skills that are unrecognized outside the country. Now, an attempt to resolve trans-subsectoral concern, like the assessment mechanism and articulation between levels and a more harmonized approach to, to total education planning and resource allocation 
was proposed in 2000 through the recommendation of the Presidential Commission on Educational Reform, the creation of a National Coordinating Council of Education or the NCEE on the premise that the time is right for such a body to be formed in order, in order to resolve trans sectoral concerns. The NCEE was proposed to, harm to harmonize, coordinate, or coordinate the trifocalized system. It was implemented into law through Executive Order Number 273, Series of 2000. However, on July 10, 2000, through Executive Order Number 632, the NCEE was the NCCE was abolished and has created the position of a presidential assistant to take over the NCCE's function. The first function was in fact given to presidential assistant Mona Dumlao Valisno by Executive Order 632. Um, wherein he was to serve as uh, the point person for trans subsectoral consultations and cost cutting policies and programs. But although management jurists might question how a staff function can have line authority. So according to some observers and critics, the reason that the EDCOM created National Coordinating Council for Education never got off the ground is something all managers know that everyone is in charge, nobody is in charge. So by making CHED, DepEd, and TESDA equal partners in education, the NCCE failed to take into account the hierarchical nature of Philippine government entities. Government people always look to the boss for direction, so-called obeisance culture. Now, the major studies named the EDCOMP, USERA, PTFE, pointed out to this, to this common direction. Experience suggests that despite, according to Mam uh, Balisno, that despite the laudable intention was met it was met with limited success and it was performed on an ad hoc basis. The seamlessness of the three education levels of policy and program levels was half achieved and resulted to continued fragmentation of efforts, programs, and strategies that caused some wasted, uh, wastage in public uh, resources. Furthermore, so uh, Ma'am Dumlao Valiso recommends an option to address the issue to institute a flat coordination mechanism and recognize the authority of the Secretary of Education as the responsible official to coordinate and harmonize education agencies. The TEB at Secretary is in a highly strategic position to orchestrate education-related matters, merge all education agencies, and include those education-related functions with the head of the, of the Department of Education as the, old, the one and only Secretary of Education. The need for a National Coordinating Council for Education was also identified in the Right Sizing Study or the 2020 Review of the Mandate, Functions, Management Systems, and Processes of Agencies in the Executive Branch, um, uh, which was uh, commissioned by the DBM and also led by Professor Alex Berliadis. Now, along with the 12 legislative agenda, there are eight policy recommendations in the EDCOM 1991 report, and this will be presented by my colleague, Mr. Jan Melendez. So thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mel. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, uh, I will be presenting to you the EDCOM policy uh, recommendation, which was implemented uh, and was partially implemented, and it's a uh, uh, brief status. So uh, later on, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Sir Alex, will furthermore discuss uh, the legislative agendas and the policy recommendations. Uh, uh, sum, summarizing which uh, was uh, implemented uh, and not implemented, uh, also the partially implemented one, uh, ones. So uh, for our first uh, EDCOM 1991 policy recommendation, uh, the goal of elementary education is progressive functional literacy uh, uh, in the following areas, uh, communication literacy, numeracy, civic and cultural literacy, science and health literacy and vocational literacy. So uh, in 1990, education for all or EFA was declared. Uh, the Philippines began to craft and later implemented the 10-year EFA Philippine plan of action covering 1991-2000. Uh, years after the Philippines came up with the Philippine EFA 2015 National Action Plan entitled Functionally 
uh, literate Filipinas uh, an educated nation. And in uh, school year 2012-2013, uh, uh, the Enhanced Basic Education Act, also known as uh, the K-12, was implemented, uh, giving more support to the reform. And uh, a four key objective was placed for the EFA initiative uh, for all out of school adults and youth. Uh, education options are provided, eliminating dropouts and repetition during the first three years of school, encouraging the completion of a full cycle of basic schooling to a satisfactory level at every grade by all Filipino children and committing to the attainment of basic education competencies uh, for everyone. So uh, for, uh, for our second uh, policy recommendation on EDCO 1991, the goal of secondary education is uh, preparation for college for the world of work. The secondary schools should consist of a junior high school and two year senior high school, uh, which we, uh, we come up, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, enacted, you know, signed into law with the passage of uh, the Enhanced Basic Education Act of 2013, uh, Republic Act uh, 10533, uh, which, which was lengthening the years of schooling to give deeper quality education, uh, is on the list of recommendations from uh, many studies, therefore giving action to the findings that strongly calls to add more years on studying at the government implemented uh, the Enhanced Basic Education Act. Uh, going to the third uh, policy recommendation, uh, an act mandating a language of instruction policy uh, for basic education. Um, grades 1 to 3 should use the vernacular. Grade 4 to 4 high schools uh, should use Filipino. English as subject from grade 3, grade 3 to 4 year high school and Filipino as subject taught from grade 1 to 4 year high school. So we have here uh, the status of... Uh, the language of instruction is the uh, mother tongue-based uh, multilingual education or the MTB MLE was uh, implemented in all public schools since the school year uh, 2012-2013 uh, and 20, uh, 2013, specifically in your kindergarten grades 1, 2, and 3. So prior to, it, prior to its implementation, the language policy for basic education was the bilingual education. No? So uh, Department uh, Order 52 Series of 1987 is specifying the use of Filipino and English language on subjects and the corresponding grade or year. So uh, just to add, uh, we have here a need to consider in teacher education, uh, the teaching of FSL with the signing into law, the RA 11106, an act declaring the Filipino sign language as the national sign language of the Filipino there and the official sign language of government in all transactions involving the deaf and mandating its use in schools, broadcast, uh, media, and workplaces. Uh, so for our fifth uh, policy recommendation, uh, adoption of a policy of teacher... Adoption of a policy of teacher and school accountability uh, for pupil learning. So uh, we have here uh, the Republic Act uh, number 9155, uh, an act instituting a framework or uh, of governance for basic education, establishing authority and accountability, renaming the Department of Education, Culture and Sports as the Department of Education and for other purposes. Uh, under the sec uh, section three, purposes and objectives. Uh, to provide the framework for the governance of basic education, which shall set the general directions for educational policies and standards and establish authority, accountability, and responsibility of, for achieving high, higher learning outcomes. And the second is to define the roles and responsibilities of and provide resources to, to the field uh, offices which shall implement educational programs, projects, and services in communities they serve. Uh, the, the, Next one is the Department uh, Deped Order 64 Series of 1995, the revised DEX system of ranking positions and employees. Uh, it's the qualification standards of teachers who shall render their services for every, every Filipino pupils uh, slash students. Department or uh, Deped Order 55 Series of 2016, policy guidelines on the national assessment of uh, student learning for the K-12 basic education program 
the process of measuring learners' progress in the attainment of learning standards and the 21st century skills, various forms of assessments and its results shall serve as data to quantify judgments on learners' academic performance uh, to assess uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of the del delivery of education services using learning outcomes as indicators. Uh, so for our uh, sixth uh, EDCOM 1991 pa uh, policy recommendation, involvement of community and parents in education, schools uh, should encourage uh, parental and community involvement on, uh, in education, which uh, the Department of Education through its subordinate rulemaking power issued DepEd Order Number 54 Series 2009, as amended by DepEd Order Number 83 uh, of 2010, or the revised guidelines governing parents, teacher associations at the school level. Uh, the recommended policy are strongly manifested in the 1987 Philippine Constitution, uh, Article uh, 13, uh, Social Justice and Human Rights, Role and Rights of Filipinas Organization, Section 15, Section 16, other supporting legal bases such as Bat uh, Batas Pambansa, uh, bilang uh, 232 Education Act of 1982, the Educational Community Section 7, uh, Ex Executive Order uh, 292 Administrative Code, Republic Act 9155, the Family Code Article 209, Article 220, and the Child and Youth Welfare Code. Uh, for our seventh uh, policy recommendation, the concurrent uh, resolution urging DEX and the Department of Budget Management to consistently accord uh, highest priority in allocating education budget to basic education and special learners, as well as those in the depressed, deprived, and underserved areas in the deployment of educational concerns. So uh, the, gover the government had been consistent with the provisions of the constitution, receiving the largest portion of the national budget is the education sector as a whole, uh, a 753.3 billion or 16.7% of the uh, 2021 budget, of which uh, 276.3 billion pesos for pre primary and primary education, uh, 228. Uh, billion for secondary education, and 99.3 billion pesos for tertiary education. The national budget of 2021 shall adapt and transition to what shall be prioritized to the new nor to the new normal. Uh, 17.2 billion uh, is allotted for the implementation of the basic education learning continuity. Uh, program or the BELCP to include the development, the production, and the delivery of learning resources. Well, uh, uh, 5.9 billion is allotted for the expansion of DepEd's computerization program, which aims to procure multimedia packages for public schools uh, nationwide. Uh, 2017, uh, 3.350 trillion national budget education sector, sector got 16.9% or a total of 567.65 billion pesos. Up to 20, uh, 2021, the education sector uh, remains the highest receiving sector of the national budget. Uh, since 2015, uh, DepEd has received the highest budget among all executive departments in the General Appropriations Act, or the GAA. According to the Department of Budget and Management, uh, People's Budget, DepEd received an increase of 30.22% or 131.75 uh, billion pesos from last year's funding of the 435 billion. So according to the Dep Dep Department of Budget and Management, this will allow the DepEd to open 53,831 teaching positions and 13,280 non-teaching posts to address the backlog in facilities. 118.8 uh, uh, billion will be used for construction, repair, and acquiring basic educational needs. It includes uh, 47,492 classrooms and 66,492 uh, sets of school seats for the K-12 program. Uh, the DepEd's budget will also make additional learning resources available. The, the department will purchase 50 million uh, textbooks and instructional materials, as well as equipment for science and mathematics for uh, 5,449 schools. Uh, uh, so uh, on this, uh, uh, slide or the table, uh, you can see that uh, from 2015 to 2021, uh, the budget is uh, relatively uh, increasing. So uh, uh, I got this from the, the D, uh, DBM uh, website. So for uh, eight, uh, the concurrent resolution urging DEX 
and DBM to give priority to uh, in allocating the education budget to the Madaris and uh, mission school, uh, mission schools that serve the cultural communities in remote areas and adapting a system for the continuous operation, expansion, and financial assistance of these schools. Uh, the resolution urging the department to give allocation in the Madaris and mission schools was being implemented through department orders, uh, giving assistance in the form of incentives and learning programs to provide and guide uh, the Muslim community education, uh, uh, like here, uh, the Deaf Ed Order Number uh, 4, Series of 2002, the operational, uh, operationalizing the Philippines Australia Project on Basic Education Assistance for Mindanao or PA uh, BIM or BAAM, uh, the Deaf Ed Order uh, Number 81 Series of uh, 2017 assistance to private madrasa, uh, an incentive to adapt the standards curriculum as authorized under Deaf Ed Order Number 51 Series 2004, and uh, the Deaf Ed Order Number 57 Series 2010, implementation of the basic education madrasa programs for Muslim out of school uh, youth and adults. So, uh, that will be all uh, for the EdCom 1991 policy recommendations. Uh, I will give the slides back to Sir Alex and thank you. Thank you very much, Chan. I know we don't we, we might be going a bit over time, but we'll just hurry. This will just take about five more slides. So the whole idea po was for us to review the EdCom. The whole idea po was for us to look at what can be built upon and really suggest uh, what, what possible next directions will happen. Okay. This was already discussed by my two colleagues. And if you look at it, 50% po, po ang implement. Uh, six out of 12, eight, uh, four out of eight. So in that sense, we can build on those already. Of course, there are some, and, but of course, we have to look at the particular context. Okay. But that's very, very important. Okay. There's some more. Okay. And these are some initiatives already that have been done by the pen. Curriculum review, remember our, our deep-seated concerns were about that? Curriculum is one of them in service professionals, reform in internal processes, including the roadmap. Of course, uh, our uh, study is embedded into the Education Futures Program, and of course, convening the Education Forum. If you recall, the whole idea of involving all our stakeholders, including including local governments, no? And of course, the basic education plan, it is there. Okay. So of course, uh, we saw we, even in the video earlier, we talked about the education, uh, educalidad, if you may, curriculum review, learning environment, teachers, upscaling and engagement of all stakeholders, including local governments. If you look at this, book, these are all uh, aligned to a vision. And we, 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 what is a vision? We're talking about 2040. We're talking about ambition in 2040. And maganda po kasi aligned siya. But equally important is also aligned to SDGs, uh, which is 2030. The whole idea, Paul, is that uh, these are also uh, aligned to the vision. So hopefully in, in, uh, we won't be talking about the same things again after 30 years as we are doing now. But we are moving on. I think so the, that's the whole idea. So moving forward, Paul, the whole message, let's build on hard-earned gains. Continuities, discontinuities. Yes, that might have been a problem, but discontinuities. Sharper focus on the agenda of EdCom. Build on this. We, it was a 12-month study. And the uh, deep-seated concerns, governance, mobilization of resources. Uh, John already pointed out the, 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 the amounts uh, in accordance with the constitution. Human resource developments at the center, at the center are really our teachers, continue professional development. And of course, equally important in, the, in inequitable access to education. Something that was mentioned, if you may, during the uh, 1925 Monroe, okay? Responsive curriculum, which you continue to do within the context of within the context of localization and competition. One eye out on the rest of the world, one eye inside. Po. The context is different. Hey, we're talking about the need not only to globalize and localize, but equally important. Let's 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 uh, face it. We are competing with our neighbors, and you and I know that sometimes when we look at these metrics with, with, with the region, well, we might be good, but we could be doing much much better. So without being presumptuous, Paul, and I'll shut up after this. Uh, I know we're, we're, we're part of the TWG. You know, continuity, build on hard-earned gains. Uh, and do not put your agenda. Number two, align with SDG. Very important, align to, to uh, focus on the primacy of human resource development. 
listening to them. Father Nebras always tells us, let's listen to them. And you have a whole, whole uh, uh, volume done about articulating the needs of teachers. But yes, let's continue to listen to them. And this one, very important, children's nutrition, our learners, you know, about uh, good practices, Cusina ng Kalinga, efforts of the Ateneo in Valenzuela, nutrition, okay? So ang point ko po, building on this and pushing the envelope further, including curriculum enhancement, including civic education, which of course part of that, and it's in part of the KIT. And finally, recognizing the impact of globalization. And maybe point here is that if we do have uh, more studies or more work, let's focus on this, mag-target na po tayo, including focused and targeted implementable plans because uh, well, I don't think we can, we should be doing again more and more studies that have already done. And as the Senate and House resolutions have shown, and as our experience over the past hundred years, the process of solicitude and reform in the age of education sector continues. With that, I'd like to thank you uh, for this opportunity and pasensya na po kayo, nag, uh, nag time po kami ng konti. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Lester. And uh, before I go, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Attorney Dimson of the Office of the President. Thank you, Madam uh, President. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that no, to, our, uh, to our presenters for that very comprehensive presentation of the findings of Education Commission Report of 1991. Uh, Dr. Brillant has already acknowledged our guests and speakers, but allow me to add I would like to recognize lang Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea, and I think the Pangitarin Sir Alex, Attorney Kyra Joyce Dimson, um, Office of the Deputy Executive Secretary for Legal Affairs, Legislative Office, Office of the President of the Philippines. All right. Uh, again, that's our four presenters, uh, headed by Dr. Alex Brillantes, Professor Hersa Del Flores, Ms. Melanie Riva, and uh, Mr. Jan Robert Melendres. At wag na po nating patagalin, no? after the presentation of the findings of EDCOM report of 1991, I think it's about time to hear the thoughts of our guest reactors for this afternoon's virtual public forum. So, simula na po natin sa ating unang uh, reactor. Our first reactor is a senator and the chairperson of the Committee on Basic Education, Arts, and Culture of the Senate of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Win Gatchalian. Thank you. Thank you for um, the introduction. And uh, let me uh, greet, of course, uh, Professor Alex Brillantes, uh, one of my, ito po isa sa mga iniidolo ko dahil of his broad and uh, very extensive uh, knowledge on local government and education as well. And let me also greet Director Teresa uh, uh, Del Flores. Uh, let me also greet Maria uh, Marivic. Dr. Marivic uh, Rakiza. Uh, let me also greet, of course, uh, Congressman uh, Roman Romulo and Secretary Briones. Um, and let me also greet, of course, uh, Dr. Nene Guevara. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very important and super timely event. Um, this is really timely, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, today we have. Um, People across the country. Uh, I've been looking at the chat box. We have people from Pangasinan, from Samar, from Bicol, from Barn, uh, from Luzon, besides in Mindanao. Uh, and uh, uh, this is probably the biggest uh, event that I've attended online. Uh, typically, ho, mga pinakamalaki na natin ko, 200. Eh, pero uh, today, I can see that a thousand. Uh, people attended this uh, event. And this is how important this event is. Uh, everyone is really concerned about the state of uh, our education in their country. And um, uh, the review of EDCOM 1 is a trigger, um, the trigger that uh, will uh, help us uh, look back on what has happened and uh, look beyond on uh, what we should do. Um, so I commend uh, Professor Alex for spearheading this uh, EDCOM 1 review. Uh, it's very comprehensive. In fact, I took a uh, dami ko nga notes na uh, uh, kinuha dito kanina. Uh, si Professor, kahit na lightning fast magsalita, uh, talagang marami ka matututunan sa kanya. So I took a lot of notes. And I will use those notes in crafting uh, uh, the proposed EDCOM 2. No? And I will discuss that, no? yeah, EDCOM 2. I will build on what um, 
Professor Alex uh, discussed earlier. Uh, I will take a lot of his ideas and his recommendations. Uh, this is probably the only comprehensive study and on, on the only comprehensive report on EDCOM 1. And I have to emphasize that because in moving towards EDCOM 2, uh, you need to make sure that you have the fundamentals, the context in place. And this is the only review and the only study that I have encountered on EDCOM 1. I mean, the most recent, at least, no? uh, because we want the most recent. And we want to build on what uh, the team of Professor Alex have done in crafting EDCOM 2. Uh, to, to a certain extent, we need continuity. Uh, and I truly believe on what uh, Professor Alex mentioned earlier. In fact, my personal mantra is always build on the gains and build on the future. Uh, when I was a mayor, that was my mantra, uh, build on the gains of your predecessor, whatever that is, it might be a small gain and build for the future because at the end of the day, you're serving the next generation of our country. So taking that mantra, I'm, I'm, I'm going to build on the gains of EDCOM 1, going to build on the gains of the report of Professor Alex and team and build for the future, looking at the future by using EDCOM 2 as the vehicle. So with that, let me just share my, I prepared a very short PowerPoint presentation um, on what your committee on education has been doing in so far as EDCOM 2 is concerned. Share oh, there. Yeah. Oops. Sorry for uh, the computer is uh, there. So, just to uh, give you some idea on what your committee, the Committee on Basic Education, have been doing, and uh, one of the activities that uh, uh, we've been covering for the last uh, few months already is uh, the Senate Joint Resolution Number Ten. Uh, and this is uh, this Senate Joint Resolution Number 10 calls for the creation of a Congressional Oversight Committee on Education. Take note that the word here is oversight, Congressional Oversight, not a commission, but an oversight. And the trigger for this uh, joint resolution, which I'm part of, and let me also emphasize that the uh, uh, prime mover of this uh, resolution is no other than Senate uh, Senator Sunny Angara. You know, he was the one who drafted it, circulated it, and we found a lot of basis on this resolution, so we co-authored it. And the basic, uh, 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 the basis uh, uh, for this uh, resolution, Senate Resolution Number Ten, or the rationale for this Senate Joint Resolution Number Ten, to put it simply, you know, is the poor performance of our learners in the recent international assessments particularly PISA. Uh, that was the trigger uh, for this joint resolution number 10. In fact, uh, this joint resolution number 10 was filed uh, a few months after, I think about two or three months after um, uh, the PISA results came out. And in that resolution, if you go through that resolution, there are a lot of preambles, a lot of uh, where assets. Uh, there's an interesting uh, preamble there. And this is to address new challenges to education resulting from the fourth industrial revolution. And I'm very happy that uh, the uh, term fourth industrial revolution was placed as part of the um, basis for this uh, joint uh, Senate, uh, Senate joint resolution number 10. So marami ho yan, ha? but I, to put it simply, these are the two most important um, preambles in uh, the joint resolution. Um, the performance of our learners, and number two, responding to the future, uh, particularly the fourth industrial revolution. So the objectives, it's very simple. Um, there are a lot of objectives, but I'm, I'm going to highlight the most important ones. Number one is to review, evaluate, and assess the gaps in the implementation of EDCOM 1, and this is where the continuity uh, comes in. And then number two, the observance of the mandates by the uh, different uh, players or the different actors in education, namely DepEd, Shed, and Testa. And um, 
Of course, the most important objective is to propose recommendations to improve performance. Um, so these are the most important objectives. There are a few more there, no? but I don't, uh, I'm going to highlight the most important. And uh, just to give you some a snapshot of the uh, salient points of this joint resolution, calls for a congressional oversight in which there are five members from the Senate, five members from the uh, House, um, and then it will uh, propose, uh, and the resolution proposes to review institutional reforms created by ECOM-1, specifically look, looking into the performance of DepEd, CHED, and TESTA. And um, uh, uh, another salient point is to raise the need to address the poor quality of basic education, given the changing and more competitive landscape, landscape of the 21st century uh, local and global labor market. So um, again, looking at the reforms that was created by EDCOM 1, and then number two, one of the most important uh, salient point is to address poor quality. So uh, these are the salient points of joint resolution number 10. And this triggered actually the Committee on Basic Education to conduct hearings and te technical working groups. And I think uh, Professor Alex for participating in that technical working group, albeit it's uh, virtual. Uh, and I thank uh, everyone uh, who participated. So these are just some of the takeaways. Now, there are a lot. No? We conducted two, uh, probably on the average, about five to six hours per session. But I would just want to give you a snapshot of the key takeaways. No? From DepEd, uh, DepEd suggested to look at the language of instruction, probably look at trifocalization, looking at technology and education, and the K to 12 implementation. These are from DepEd. They suggested to look at these four items. Then Father Nebres uh, suggested that to focus on important problems, uh, which includes stu student, uh, poor student performance. So he narrowed it down you know, to the most important problem at hand, which is poor student performance. Um, of course, uh, if you look at the macro point of view, there are a lot of things to look at. And sometimes uh, you get confused. But uh, Father never suggested just to focus the most important aspect. And this is poor student performance. He also suggested to listen to the teachers, to the principals, people from the ground. Uh, we invited Brother Armin and he suggested to empower school principals, which I totally agree. Because the battleground is not in DepEd Pasig, but the battleground is on a per school basis. No, Anggera na sa school. Eh. That's where the challenge uh, 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 comes. And it's important that our principals are uh, equipped and given the flexibility to respond to the challenges. Uh, Ina, through uh, Professor uh, Arellano, recommended to uh, anchor uh, EDCOM 2 on the SGDs, uh, SDGs, especially number four. And Sinergia also uh, suggested that uh, EDCOM Two you know, should be composed of uh, expert business leaders, members of the academic, civil society, student parents, and teachers. So these are just key takeaways. Of course, marami to, huh? there's a lot, no? but we just highlighted uh, some of the key takeaways uh, from the hearings. So looking at uh, those uh, key takeaways from uh, the hearing and from our internal discussion and analysis, and from our consultation with um, uh, key stakeholders. Uh, these are the salient points that we propose for the proposed uh, EDCOM 2. And uh, I have, we tweaked the resolution number 10 a little bit mm. uh, because what we want is not to conduct an oversight over EDCOM 1. EDCOM 1 was 30 years ago. A lot of things have already changed after 30 years. Uh, even though they were talking about technology, I heard uh, Professor Alex mentioned earlier, even they were talking about 2020 technology. Fourth Industrial Revolution at that time was just being watched in Star Wars or in uh, the movies. You know? But the Fourth Industrial Revolution now is a reality. So to conduct an oversight, if EDCOM 1 uh, fulfilled its uh, mandates or not, uh, it's already too late for that, in, in my humble opinion. 
What we want is to focus on the problem at hand. And that's what we want for EDCO. Uh, we don't want to go back 30 years ago and um, debate on whether those proposals 30 years ago uh, will make a difference to the problems right now, such as poor student uh, performance. So we want to focus on, on, on performance. Number two, uh, to convert the oversight committee into a commission to give it a much higher stature and to give it a sense of independence. Uh, the main, main difference between a commission and a committee is just the stature and also the independence. And uh, that's why in, in this particular proposal uh, for EDCOM2, we will call it a commission rather than an oversight committee. And then um, uh, uh, in the law that we're proposing, it will be a, 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 a balancing act. Uh, we will not uh, stifle the flexibility of the commission proper itself, but the law will give it a framework you know, for it to focus on. So we will give a lot of leeway for the commission uh, for the commissioners you know, to chart its own direction, but the law will confine it and put certain direction on what it should look at. And these are the things that uh, uh, we want them to look at. Number one, uh, letter A, observance of the mandates of DepEd, CHED, and PESTA. Um, in my opinion, and again, in my humble opinion, uh, we should not look at whether trifocalization is working or not anymore. Uh, debating on trifocalization will take a lot of energy, emotions, and time. And uh, in my opinion, again, uh, if we open the topic of whether we go back to a singular uh, education entity or try moving further with trifocalization, uh, that will be a very lengthy debate. And three years probably will not be enough no? because the law calls for a three-year um, lifespan for the commission. But it's important to look at the mandates because the trifocalization created mandates. And it's important to look at those mandates, whether those are being fulfilled or not. Then we look at the overall education governance in the country on a per, uh, per uh, sector basis. So for example, uh, we want to look at whether the uh, the principals are empowered enough or not to respond to the challenges in their community. I strongly believe that the battleground is on a per school basis and our general there uh, is the principal and we have to make sure that they have, she has the enough, enough uh, power and enough uh, authority to respond to those challenges. So the governance uh, structure should be looked at also. And let us see digital transformation. Uh, digital transformation is the activity. The end goal is fourth industrial revolution. And uh, we need to look at uh, how to hasten digital transformation in our uh, education sector. And then the recommendations should be disruptive, concrete, and targeted. And this is something that we introduced in this uh, resolution, that it has to be um, uh, uh, disruptive enough. You know? Uh, it has to be concrete and it has to be targeted. So specific targeted and time-bound solutions uh, is very important. We, don't, we want to do away with motherhood statements and with motherhood concepts. We need to have targets. We need to make sure that it's time-bound. And we need to make sure that it's, um, it's uh, uh, concrete and disruptive in order to move the needle. Uh, if you keep on saying that we need to spend more, we need to increase the salary, uh, these are age-old problems. That's what Ale uh, Professor Alex mentioned earlier. These are deep-seated problems. It will be deep-seated for the next 20 years. The budget will not, uh, will not overnight uh, uh, triple or quadruple. And we all know that in the crafting of the budget, it's always a tug of war between departments. So uh, to give motherhood statements of allocating more funds, uh, that's not going to solve our problem. It is a factor, but we need something more uh, disruptive and concrete and more specific in terms of solution rather than motherhood statements. Oops. And uh, we propose to uh, 
to have a life the, the commission we propose to for the commission to have a lifespan of three years the first phase the first one and a half years will concentrate on basic education the second phase will concentrate on higher and technical education but i have a caveat to this uh, this post facing uh, was uh, uh, was uh, uh, received by a lot of uh, caution uh, in our hearing, uh, a lot of the resource person suggested that instead of doing a phasing, let's do a subdividing of committees. No? Uh, the logic why the committee proposed a phasing approach is for the commission to focus on one specific uh, sector in our education system. No? For example, uh, the first phase, everyone concentrates on basic education. In the second phase, everyone concentrates on higher and technical education. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of our resource person uh, recommended that instead of doing a phasing, let's just do a, a subcommittee approach, wherein everything will be conducted and um, uh, everything will be conducted and everything will be, uh, everything will commence at the same time, but it will be handled by different subcommittees. And I'm open to that. You know? I'm open to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to remove the phase in uh, system, but instead coming up with different committees looking at basic education and higher education. And then, uh, of course, we will create a technical secretariat wherein the technical secretariat will, uh, it will, will have a lifespan of five years. The extra two years is meant to uh, solve the, uh, the uh, continuity and the implementation problem. So after three years, the technical secretariat will coexist and then the oversight committee of Congress will step in. And this is where continuity will happen because the technical secretariat can uh, uh, brief, can uh, pass on the work that the commission has made to the oversight committee. The com oversight committee is purely oversight, you know, making sure that the recommendations are being implemented. And then number three, this is an introduction again, uh, that uh, PIDS will be the research arm of the commission. Um, and the logic for this is uh, we want the commission to uh, hit the ground running. Hiring experts, getting uh, 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 experts in various fields will take time. Uh, conducting research will take time. But PNDS with its network of researchers and with its discipline uh, can jumpstart the uh, research process right away. So we introduce um, the, uh, this provision wherein the PIDS will be the research arm of the commission. However, a lot of our uh, resource person, even PIDS themselves, have recommended that, um, that uh, the commission should be allowed to get other experts you know, in very specific fields, you know, for example, in curriculum, for example, in teacher education, and we will do that. You know, we will include uh, provision there wherein uh, the commission will have that liberty of um, getting other experts. And then, uh, like I mentioned, in number four, uh, right after the three-year term, uh, a joint congressional oversight will be, will be created, and this oversight will have one single responsibility to make sure that uh, the recommendations are enacted. And personal reflections after the uh, two hearings and two te technical working group. There are still a lot of things that we need to uh, discuss in terms of implementation and oversight, uh, making sure that uh, uh, Congress will not overstep its uh, powers in terms of implementation. We know that implementation lies within the ambit of um, the executive side. Um, we have to make sure that the law will not uh, uh, encroach on the mandates and the powers of the executive side. Uh, one of the concerns of our source persons or, or the people who attended the hearing um, is the lack of accountability. You know? And this is what they uh, observed during EDCOM 1. Who is accountable for which law? Who is accountable for which policy? And uh, this is one of the um, issues that we want to uh, resolve in the law. And then number three, um, there are different uh, mindsets on whether to focus on the learner on or on the education sector. And my point of view is, let's focus on the learner, uh, especially the performance. Um, looking at the entire education sector per se. You know, uh, of course, we have to look at the entire education sector 
as a uh, as the context, but we have to narrow it down to the performance of the learner because that, that's the problem at hand. Uh, we don't want to um, again no, uh, untangle the work of uh, Edcom One because that will take time, and uh, we don't have the luxury of time considering that we've been performing uh, quite poorly in a lot of the international assessments. And we want to uh, uh, make sure that after one year, we'll have concrete uh, solutions, uh, very effective recommendations that we can even implement after one year. We don't have to wait for the three-year term to end. So with that, uh, again, thank you, Professor Alex, for uh, jump-starting our work. I, I, I have to uh, thank you a lot because uh, reviewing EDCOM 1 is really quite uh, challenging and I, I thank you for doing that uh, in behalf of the committee and uh, uh, we will definitely build on your work uh, to make sure that uh, EDCOM 2 will uh, deliver what it promised uh, or what it will promise and it will deliver the solutions that our uh, learners will need and our education uh, sector uh, uh, will need. So thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, that's Senator Win Gachalian, the chairperson of the Committee on Basic Education, Arts and Culture of the Senate of the Philippines. Siguro diretso na po tayo kagad sa ating second reactor. Our second reactor is a representative for the Lone District of Pasig City and the chairperson of the Committee on Basic Education and Culture of the House of Representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Representative Roman T. Romulo. Yes, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat uh, kay Senator Wynn, nakakatapos lang. Uh, of course, kay Sec uh, Secretary uh, Briones, nakasama rin po natin dito. Kay Chair Popoy, na nabanggit, nakasama rin po natin. Of course, sa UPNC PAG and Social Watch, uh, thank you very much for this invitation uh, to listen to uh, your presentation. Una-una, no, uh, uh, Dr. Brillantes, alam ko magkasama tayo noon ano, sa higher education and we both uh, know very well na during our stint uh, doon sa higher education, nakita po natin talaga na ang problema ay uh, marami tayong kailangan uh, gawin sa basic education. That is why I am sure uh, you initiated this review of EDCOM 1. Again, thank you again, ano, uh, Dr. Villante, sa ating UPNC PAG and Social Watch. But again, ano, we must move forward na. Uh, again, ano, uh, EDCOM 1 is EDCOM 1. It had its uh, recommendations. Uh, we were briefed already kung ano yung mga uh, partially implemented, fully implemented, and ano pa yung mga challenges. But uh, nandito na tayo eh. May mga bagong challenges talaga. We know the problems. Siguro it's time to really uh, just learn ano, uh, what happened uh, uh, to what happened sa EDCOM 1. Kung uh, yung mga success stories and not so successful stories. Para sa akin, simple lang. Ano. Tinitingnan ko lang yung unang-una po, uh, hindi lamang yung mga international assessment examinations sa lumabas. Hindi lamang po yung PISA, yung uh, SEA PLM, or kaya yung TIMS na mga lumabas na exams. At uh, tinitina ko rin po, uh, kahit uh, sa mga committee hearings po natin, o kahit makinig lang tayo sa kanya-kanya mga distrito pag, nakikin, pag nakakausap natin yung mga magulang, yung mga teachers, at syempre kahit paano yung mga business leaders sa ating mga lugar, Maliwanag naman ang problema eh. Ang problema talaga ay uh, hindi tayo properly focused dun sa ating mga learners. The PISA exam, siguro the other exam showed us that yung uh, reading comprehension natin, kahit pa paano kailangan natin i-improve yun. So we don't have to really talk about uh, uh, high faluting uh, theories or words or whatever. Doon lang tayo. May, may problema sa, sa reading skills, may problema sa reading comprehension. Siguro sa pamamagitan rin namin dalawa ni Senator Wynn, we can convince uh, the Department of Education that it is high time that we focus, kinali sa grades 1 to 3. Reading, reading, reading. Literacy talaga po ang pinaka-importante. Siguraduhin lang po natin na yung ating mga uh, studyante na nasa grades 1 to 3 ay nakakapagbasa at naiintindihan yung binabasa nila. Hindi na po natin kailangan pang ano, pag-usapan pa ko ng bagay. Pag naturuan po natin sila 
yung uh, functional literacy, kasama rin po dyan, of course, yung uh, konting mathematics sa grades 1 to 3, I think uh, that will be a big achievement. And we don't need any education summit for that. I think uh, kayang-kaya naman ang dep dyan, but lahat tayo kailangan magsama-sama to convince everyone na this is the way forward. Dito na lang tayo. Focus tayo. Learners sa grades 1 to 3, read, read, read. Pag natuto po sila, example po, ah, uh, Dr. Brillantes and, and to the uh, social watch. Ito po, dumating ang uh, COVID-19. Of course, mas importante sa atin yung safety, security ng mga kabataang Pilipino. That is why uh, we said instead of having the uh, traditional face-to-face -face na yun ang nakasanayan natin lahat and I think that is the best method, yung face-to-face, -face, we were forced to adjust. Ang ginamit po natin yung distance or blended learning kasi hinalo natin ng, uh, ng mga modular learning rin. Pero nakita natin, hindi ganun kadali, ang daming challenges, yung mga magulang, yung mga teachers, lahat ginawa na, pero talagang yung learning doon mas mahirap. Pero isipin po natin, kung from the time of EdCom 1 to today, ang pinokus lang natin, grades 1 to 3, reading, 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 eh di siguro po ang mga estudyante naging sarili rin nilang teacher during this pandemic. If they know how to read and they understand and comprehend what they are reading, sila na po mismo ang uh, may kita po natin, sisiguraduhin po nila na uh, yung interest nila ay mafulfill nila. Hindi po tayo magkakaroon ng iba-ibang mga komplikasyon, mga problema, mga adjustments. Again po, face-to-face no, -face is the best, but of mas primordial po sa atin, ang uh, mas importante ay uh, uh, mas importante po sa atin yung kaligtasan ng mag-aaral natin. So hopefully, as we move forward, pinaka-importante po sa atin ay yung reading, reading, reading. Sana po, uh, alam ko, ginawa naman ng DepEd from the 15,000 plus uh, competencies, binabaan na nila yan to the most essential competencies uh, until more than 5,000. Pero again, ano, uh, this is something that we must again just ensure kung dyan tayo mag-test, siguro doon natin marunong magbasa at naiintindihan yung binabasa. Of course po, yan yung mga problema na sinasabi natin at pinaka-importante na doon tayo sa mga estudyante natin. Pero hindi rin po natin pe pwedeng iwanan yung mga ibang issues at siguro magiging parte naman po ito ng, uh, mag, mag, pag nagkaroon tayo ng Education Summit 2. Ano? Uh, yung sa mga teachers naman po natin, alam natin na nabanggit naman kanina na pagdating naman po sa salary at ibang bagay, talagang uh, mahirap naman mga ako dyan. Because uh, to lang, that's, uh, that's a matter of, uh, sabihin na natin talagang uh, finance po yan. Basta may pera naman ng DBM, naniniwala ako ang DepEd, na ibibigay naman nila yung karapat-dapat para sa ating uh, mga guro. Pero mayroon tayong isa na pwede na ngayon siguro ayusin na para sa ating mga guro. Dito po sa amin lunsod, uh, napapansin ko po ang lagi binabangit sa akin ng mga teacher, ang dami nilang ginagawa aside from teaching. Hindi lang po sila nakafocus sa subject na kung saan sila expert. Pero ang daming ibang pinapagawa sa kanila. Siguro po, yun ang isa natin pag-aralan. Unang-una po, may mga posisyon na pwede naman po natin siguraduhin by law. Liwanagin natin, clarify natin na dapat mag-hire na ang DepEd. Example po, pinag-uusapan lagi yung guidance counselors. Because now talaga may, may mental health problem. Eh. I mean, nagkakaroon ng ganyan ng mga issue, di ba nababanggit lagi yan. Pero pag pinag-uusapan po natin yan, magtanong tayo, napakakunti po ng talagang registered guidance counselors na nakapaloob sa ating mga paralan. That's the truth. Bakit po? Una-una, wala naman talagang career progression, mababa ang sweldo pag guidance counselor ka. I think, uh, together with the Senate, pwede tayong gumawa dyan ng mga paraan para masigurado po natin na yung trabaho ng isang teacher na academic talagang you know, expertise niya, yun lang ang gawin niya. Yung mga admin, admin work, yung mga guidance counselor, mag-hire tayo ng karapat-dapat ng mga experts naman sa bagay na yan para yung mga... Uh, teachers natin, mga guru natin, sigurado nakafocus dun sa kailangan nilang gawin. At yun yung uh, pagturo ng, ng uh, expertise nila sa ating mga estudyante. Siguro po, no, hindi ko naman mababanggit lahat ng gusto mabanggit, pero I will jump then po to the next one. Ito naman po, uh, again po, yung sa trifocalization. Tama po, nandito na tayo, may trifocalization na we should live with that. We should make it work because it's it's already here. Wala na, wala na masyadong, masyadong uh, mahaba pang proseso para baguhin yan. Pero let us uh, put it now sa right direction. Example po, 
pagdating po sa teachers natin, uh, uh, nakapagtaka naman po, bakit ang uh, DepEd, who uh, houses about 900,000 plus teachers, eh parang napakalit ng say nila pagdating ng uh, uh, curriculum sa ating uh, universities and colleges. Kaya sa amin po, in fact, napasa na po namin, uh, it will be on the floor na, gusto po natin talaga na magkaroon ng say yung ating DepEd sa at least sa minimum sa, sa, sa uh, tinatawag nating curriculum o yung dapat matutunan ng ating mga teachers habang dumadaan po sila ng kanilang uh, college o university. Pangalawa po, sa Teacher Education Council po, at uh, sa, meron po tayong PRC na nagbibigay ng examination. Pero sa totoo po, uh, blind po ang uh, DepEd dyan, and I think even ang CHED, kung ano ba talagang tinatanong sa mga, sa mga exam na ito. Hindi ba parang uh, merong mali doon na kailangan baguhin? I hope that the Senate will be with us here in amending the Teacher Education uh, Council Uh, uh, the law pertaining to it to allow uh, at least uh, at least pagkatapos po ng exam dapat naman ay pinapakita ng PRC yung mga exam na binigay nila sa ating mga let takers para uh, unang-una mabigyan sila ng tamang advice suggestions baka hindi naman uh, tugma na yung mga tinatanong baka panahon naman rin na na mag-suggest ang DepEd Ched na mga dapat na mga katanungan na talagang yun naman ang pinakaimportante na kasangkap na magagamit ng isang teacher sa kanyang pagtuturo especially pag nandoon na siya sa mga eskwelahan po natin. Siguro po uh, alam ko na binigyan lang kami ng 10 to 15 uh, minutes. Marami pa ho tayong kailangan pag-usapan pero sana po kung meron lang isang uh, at least ma ma maalala po dito. Hopefully po no. Ah uh, nakita na natin yung problema. Mababa po yung results results natin sa PISA sa CIA PLM, sa TIMS, kailangan po talaga, yun na lang sagutin natin, at least for grades 1 to 3. Reading, reading, reading. Hayaan na po natin na uh, magtiwala tayo sa talino ng uh, batang Pilipino. Turuan lang natin siya magbasa, naintindihan po niya. Sigurado ko po, malayo ang mararating niya. Pangalawa po, yung sa teacher's concern, siguro po panahon na yung at least yung administrative burdens, alisin na po natin sa kanila. At sa DepEd naman po, ilang uh, departamento po at nakita ko naman po ano in fairness po sa DepEd and and, uh, and sa mga teachers po ng DepEd ano uh, from day one, nung uh, na declare yung ECQ last year March 15 probably 2020 alam po talagang dire-diretso yung trabaho eh hindi na lalo na po yung mga teachers dito sa amin nakita ko na hindi na sila kailangan tawagan eh talagang pumunta para lang tinanong nila ano yung adjust kasi exam week po yun eh papasok na ng exam na ano yung gagawin ng teachers. So nakita po natin yung commitment na doon. So, siguro tulungan na natin ang DepEd, tulungan na natin ang ating teachers dito sa mga uh, problema po na dinadaanan nila na ang tagal na eh. So again, ano po ah, yung DepEd Com 1, okay na po yan. Let's move on na po. Let's move on from Ed, uh, EdCom 1. Let's uh, look at the problems now and let's uh, resolve the problems even let's not wait na po. Kung ano yung pwedeng gawin ng legislative, gawin natin. Kung ano kaya ng DepEd gawin, gawin na po natin. Yung mga kinakailangan na isa ilalim po sa isang uh, education summit uh, committee, okay lang po yun, gawin natin. Pero again po, no, uh, there are many things. Uh, there are low-lying fruits already na pwede po natin gawin ngayon pa lang. Hindi na po natin kailangan masyadong theoretical o pahabain pa yung, yung diskasyonan. Tulungan na po natin talaga. Yung nakita na natin problema, tulungan na tayo, resolve na po natin to. Again, Dr. Brillantes, thank you very much for your time. Kung nag-extend ako, but again po, ang dami pa po talagang uh, pwedeng mapag-usapan. Pero again po, we will wait na lang po for, uh, for a time na we will have more time. Again, thank you to everyone. God bless and stay safe. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much po. Maraming maraming salamat po. Again, ladies and gentlemen, that's Representative Roman Romulo. Representative for the Lone District of Pasig City and the Chairperson po of the Committee on Basic Education and Culture of the House of Representatives. Siguro dumiretso na po tayo sa ating third reactor. Let's, uh, let's now proceed to our next reactor. Our reactor is from the Civil Society Organization. He is the co-convener of the Social Watch Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Rene Raya. Sir, um, kindly unmute po.
All right, habang hinihintay po natin si Sir Rene Raya, um, yes, we have roughly 1,000 viewers dito po sa ating Zoom. At nung chinect din po namin yung web uh, Facebook page ng DepEd Philippines and also ng Center for Leadership, Citizenship, and Democracy, we have roughly 2,000 viewers din po sa ating Facebook Live. I believe um, okay na po. Uh, again, uh, hello, yes. Hello, uh, Lester. There, there, sorry, I can hear you now. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the co-convener of Social Watch Philippines, Mr. Rene Raya. Okay, sorry for that technical glitch. Uh, and thank you, Lester, and congratulations to you. Siguro, unang-una, uh, nagpapasalamat na uh, ako kami doon sa ating mga presenters no, for walking us through the key findings of EDCOM that some of them uh, are still applicable uh, and also could serve as a, uh, as a basis uh, for doing our reforms uh, in the education sector. And greetings uh, also to the honorable and hardworking legislators uh, si Senator uh, Win Gachalian, saka si Rep. Uh, uh, Roman Romulo. We appreciate your leadership and concern po uh, in moving education forward. And to our grand mentor, Secretary Junior Magdolis uh, Briones, and to Chair uh, Popoy Bidera, maraming salamat for increasing this event and for untiringly taking up the challenge of education. So, uh, without further ado, greetings to everyone uh, from, uh, you know, uh, across the country. I will focus my comments, no, yung reaction ko dun sa financing of education. And from there, no, uh, to look into the best uh, intervention mix uh, drawing from the key recommendations of EDCO and the succeeding broad sectoral studies, no. Tama po yung comment ni Senator Win kanina about having only motherhood statement, no, baka naman on the budget, because uh, definitely it uh, cannot be done overnight, no. But at the same time, baka pwede po na i-accelerate and to look into uh, the issues related to financing, because definitely that will play a very important role, no, in uh, uh, supporting the reforms uh, that we think uh, can move education forward. So hoping that this can still be included no, high in the agenda of uh, the forthcoming commission. Ito po yung isang key finding ng, edu uh, edu uh, ng EDCOM 1991 on quality and financing. Nabanggit na ito kanino ni Professor Brillantes. No? The quality of Philippine education is in a state of continuous decline. And there are two principal reasons no, behind this decline. Yung una po, simply we are not investing enough in education. And number two, uh, education establishment is uh, poorly managed. No? Uh, siguro uh, yung usapin ng uh, management, ipapaubaya na natin ito sa mga academic community, MCPAG, uh, for example, and PIBS, no? na mas magagaling dun sa issue ng management. Uh, but being social watch is uh, quite passionate, no? Uh, in relation to looking into uh, the issue of uh, investing no, on financing of education. Uh, ito pong uh, edcom finding on financing, parati na lang pong nauulit sa mga susunod na mga broad sectoral reviews on education. Kung matatandaan po natin, 10 years after the edcom, we had the uh, best, no, yung uh, Philippine education sector uh, studies, no, and also PISER in 19, those were in 1998 and 1999, and recommending no, uh, also uh, looking into the inadequacy of financing to improve no, the quality of basic education. Uh, PES was actually even more emphatic, no, uh, stressing on the need to hire no, uh, for higher investment in education to be able to reverse no, the decline ng ating education. Noong pong uh, 2000, ang social watch nag-dance po yan ng pag-aaral dahil ito po yung 10 years after EDCOM tapos uh, uh, simula po ng MDGs at saka ng EFA2, Education for All 2. No? Um, and uh, in that study related to financing, no, one of the you know, critical findings that uh, we saw was yung uh, per capita spending natin po in 2000 in real terms, no? What at the same level as that was, uh, as it was in 1978. So after so many years, no, hindi po umangat yung ating per capita spending level in real terms. 
And that level of spending definitely cannot buy us quality education. Kahit po, uh, ano po yung mga reformang iihain natin, pero na kung uh, napakaliit po ng ating uh, budget na linalaan, ay mahihirapan po natin itulok, itulak itong mga napakagandang mga reforma. No? Uh, at uh, ano eh, uh, siguro kung titignan natin, hindi pa namin ako compute uh, 30 years after, no? from 2000 to the current period, uh, after uh, the NVGs and the FA, baka hindi rin po nag-improve no? uh, or just an inch higher lang itong ating per capita spending in real terms. No? Ganun po ang findings ngayon. Currently, if we base from the statistics of the World Bank and UNESCO on education spending globally, that would validate no, these uh, findings that we see now. No? Uh, sa ang Asia Pacific po, ito yung lowest spender in education among all global regions. And in Asia, the Philippines is among the lowest, no? Uh, nakakalungkot po kasi ang sabi ng NEDA, no? Uh, ano, we're already at the threshold of becoming an upper middle income country, no? If it were not for COVID-19. Uh, but our spending pattern po in education is very similar to those of the low income countries. Uh, kaya I think this is something that we really have to look into and uh, probably... Uh, the uh, Education Commission can, uh, you know, can look at this as one of the agenda or high on the agenda uh, that will be discussed. No? You know, in the 1950s and in the 1960s, uh, if I recall, no, at yung day lang ito, galing din sa baon ng uh, DepEd, no, we were spending about 30% of our national budget for education. Uh, but then we took a long time, starting in the 70s, no? And our spending level over around 7% na lamang po of the total budget. No? And in the 1980s and much of the 1990s, we were burdened no, with allocating a third of our budget for debt payment. No? Uh, kaya po napakabigat. No? We struggled hard to really uh, find uh, uh, ano, uh, funding for the social sector, especially education. No? Uh, pero we are now uh, basically over this, no? At baka pwede pong tignan, no? On how we can accelerate investment for education. So, i-fast forward ko na lang in the interest of time, no? Uh, yung World Bank uh, supported and together with OSAID did uh, study in 2016 and uh, ganun pa rin po ang findings, no? Even if uh, they... Uh, already noted na merong is improvement in the spending levels no, on education. Kaya lamang despite these increases, the Philippines still spends less on education than many of our neighboring and middle-income countries. No? So maganda po, meron ng momentum kahit papano. No? Uh, and this has to be sustained uh, and it actually has been sustained uh, uh, more in the last five years. No? Uh, where we registered significant increases, no, even under COVID. Uh, so really thanks to our legislators no, and to our DEPED uh, for protecting the education budget. No? Uh, and that is in terms of uh, the budget relative to GDP and the budget uh, relative to the total spending of government. So uh, lumalapit na po tayo doon sa global benchmarks no? uh, as agreed upon, no? Uh, in the SDGs no? and uh, in Education 2030. So we're almost there no? and uh, we hope that uh, we can, no? <laughs> we hope that we can uh, improve for the, our spending level. Uh, and another significant improvement, I think, is the utilization, uh, which has uh, vastly been improved, no? yung burn rate natin, because this is also a major problem. Meron pang pera, pero hindi naman nagagamit. No? Uh, and uh, I think this is one concern, and this has been uh, improved no, over the last five years. No? So it's not only the size of the budget. No? Kailangan makita natin, no? we should be able to determine exactly where we should be investing the result uh, in order to have the optimum outcome. No? And I think uh, EDCOM and other studies have well identified many of the critical areas no that can you know that that, that can uh, provide no results uh, and optimum outcome for our education no so let me now go to pisa 
No, I won't be telling about the story of how you know bad we fare, um, because that has been uh, told over and over again over the past two years now. But more on the other side of PISA, no, ano ba yung mga ibang key findings nila that would uh, inform, no, and would help us in really analyzing the issues related to education. Uh, una uh, at sinabi na related to uh, spending level. Ang expenditure per student po natin ay lowest among uh, all PISA participating countries and economies. No? So take note, yung kaklasi po natin dito sa bottom level ay yung Dominican Republic. And Dominican Republic uh, has been spending three times more than our spending level on per capita basis. No? Uh, ang isa pong finding no, na maganda dun sa PISA, no, uh, being disadvantaged is not destiny. No, that means uh, investing among our poor and excluded, no, mga left behind the uh, children and youth natin is a good investment. Uh, hindi po yan walang pag-asa, kundi uh, ano lang, mabigyan natin ng tamang opportunity and they will and they can excel, no. Uh, and then uh, another important uh, finding, no, an overwhelming majority of Filipino students agreed that their teacher shows enjoyment in teaching. No, much higher, no, really much higher about Asian sector uh, that we should be able to build on. No? So on the other hand, 65% po ng students natin no, ay, uh, uh, have reported being bullied no, several times uh, in the past months. No? And this is three times more than the OECD average. No? So more likely uh, they will skip uh, school, lost interest, no, having low performance, and at least of really dropping out altogether from the school system. No? Yan po yung isang malungkot na bagay. On the other hand, no, uh, uh, it was also noted in PISA na yung cooperation among students po, yung sa ating uh, community, no, school community is high no, among students. No? Uh, ensuring, kaya yung ensuring an inclusive environment at school or a sense of belonging really facilitates learning. No? Uh, tamang-tama, eh, parang Filipino culture yan, eh, yung uh, sama-sama tayo, no? uh, magtulungan tayo, no? uh, and uh, if you feel that you belong no? uh, to the school system, then that can be a great facilitator for learning. No? Uh, ensuring that uh, ano yan, eh, uh, child-friendly, no? safe, inclusive yung environment mo, and there is participation. No? Uh, siguro pati na yung teachers in uh, you know, crafting the curriculum and in governance of uh, the school system. No, so these findings, po, ng, uh, from PISA and from the others, no, uh, st sectoral studies beg for policies and probably legislation, no, and more resources that are quite pointed. No, ito na po napakaganda po ng mga recommendations na to, mga insights, no, uh, and I believe that much of this. Uh, are already being uh, well articulated in DepEd policies and reform packages. No? So, uh, siguro ang kinakailangan na lang natin dito eh, maitulak pa ng gusto. No? So, again, teacher quality, uh, learning environment, uh, ensuring an inclusive, child-friendly, safe, and caring and participatory environment can really provide a good no, uh, uh, environment uh, for learning. And then I should add also yung uh, research and development. Siguro nasa ano na to, literature na ito ng DEPET, but I would like to really emphasize na maliit po yung ating investment for research and development. No? Uh, maganda po kung every school can be turned into a research institution at lahat po ng teacher would have that opportunity to undertake uh, research po. So na uh, let me end no finally on the edcom the proposed edcom 2 no I really realize no the urgency of addressing the critical education issues no but there's a bit of uh, you know discomfort about the timing uh, maybe it's a bit late no uh, when we should have done this earlier probably in 2010 or maybe at the start of the current administration into in 2016 or maybe it is a bit too early for the next DepEd administration to co-organize such uh, uh, a, an initiative no? so that it could be a good way to start. No? And maybe now is the best time to consolidate no, whatever reforms and gains we have had in the education sector and dis disentangle yung mga barriers na nakikita natin along the way. No? 
So there's already too much of good recommendations around. No, uh, maybe the time to up uh, is best done now. No, and uh, I think uh, ano napakaganda din ng initiative na ginagawa natin sa Kongreso. At uh, kung ito po ay uh, mabibigyan natin ng pansin at the same time that we also look into the pending legislations para magkaroon po ng uh, pagganapan itong mga ilang reforms na underway na napakaganda po kung kayang pagsabayin. No? And so that is our hope that uh, we will not forget uh, the key legislations that uh, you know that that beg for uh, action and for resources maraming salamat po yes sir maraming maraming salamat po again uh, that's mr rene raya the co-convener of the social watch philippines ngayon punta na po tayo sa ating fourth reactor our fourth and final reactor comes from the private sector He Policy Manager of the Philippine Business for Education, or PIBED. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Marco de los Reyes. Thank you very much, Lester. Um, before I share my screen and my presentation, my reaction, let me first greet our uh, esteemed uh, guests and uh, panelists and then uh, reactors or co-reactors. Let me start with Senator Wim Gachalian, our uh, chairperson of the Senate Committee on Education our uh, representative, uh, Congressman uh, Roman Romulo, Secretary Lenore Briones of the Department of Education, Chad Chair, uh, Popeye Guevara, uh, Iriling, of, uh, Iriling Constantino of uh, TESDA. Uh, of course, our uh, team who presented, uh, led by Dean Alex Brillantes, my dean uh, when I was still in NCPAD very long time ago, I think. Is, is Sagil already here? Uh, so my former professor, uh, all the organizers, uh, CSOs, education partners in government, everyone, good afternoon to you. Let me start my uh, reaction presentation and I titled it as We Need an Edcom 2. And on the title alone, this is already a vote of support to the House and Joint and Senate resolution calling for the, con the convening of the Second Education Commission. And I will try to persuade everyone why this is so. And this was uh, presented earlier by Dean Brillantes and his team. Um, the continuities and discontinuities of uh, policy after EDCOM 1, that there has been uh, what I would call as policy spurts and then narrow on drifts. I observe that there are a core, uh, some four years where there are uh, very uh, good and huge policies created that would be in the early 90s and in the early 2010s, right? Early 90s because uh, katatapos lang nung EDCOM 1. And then early, in, in the uh, early 2010s, we see here 2012, 2013, you know, when we had the universal kindergarten law passed, uh, the K-12 law was passed, we had the anti-bullying and so on. We even have an open distance learning app, open high school. So we could have been, or I think based on this policy alone, I think we should have been really prepared for the pandemic. But in the recent, or because of the recent um, good policies, and I would have it and, and reveal that because of those good policies, I would say that more and more students are actually getting and staying in school, right? And uh, these are all based on um, official statistics. Our uh, basic education, uh, gross enrollment, the elementary cohort survival and completion rates have been really improving in the past decade. Imagine uh, 20, 2009 or um, more than 10 years ago, out of 100 grade one students, only around 75 uh, students will finish grade six. Now it's around 90. So that's fantastic, fantastic news. And we owe it. To the, the, to the students um, to provide quality education. And that is the crux of the discussion that we've been having for the past um, several hours right now, that uh, the quality of education is really one thing. And estimates say that um, it appears that even if we have a 12 year or 13 year formal education, um, if, we analyze, if we sum it up along with other countries, they normalize it. Our, our education uh, learnings of our basic education students around six years, I believe six. So 
if that is the uh, context, where does the private sector come in? Ah, so we see here that the private sector, pala, the businesses, they really engage into training. In fact, this is a, a strength, a strength of, of our country that our uh, businesses really uh, provide formal training to their workers. Right? And in fact, we are uh, above uh, our, the, the regional average. We are a top performer on this aspect. And I guess the next slide that I will show summarizes um, the context that where we are right now. On your left side in the green, um, in green boxes are our strengths in, term, in terms of innovation, uh, strengths and strengths rather. So firms offering formal training, ICT services, mm -hmm. exports and creative exports. Wow, we are in the top seven. Top 10, we are in the top 10, which means to say that Filipinos are really good, right? Given the opportunity for, uh, for us to enter into um, uh, the employment sector and providing us the, the, the uh, necessary trainings, we really perform. However, there is a huge base um, who can only have or access um, subpar quality education. And this is on the right side of your screen, the weaknesses. Uh, which I box in, 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 in red, education, ex education expenditure, and mga So you see here, this is a push and pull that we have here. This is our strength. Filipinos are really good. And we are primarily pulled down uh, because of the quality uh, that we are having in our education sector, right? If that is the context, the pandemic is changing the rules of the game and fast. So I showed you earlier that yes, firms are, Filipino firms are offering training to their workers, but because of the pandemic, here's the trend, decline, decline of uh, form, firms offering formal training. And this is in the world. And I would hypothesize that the same is true in the Philippines, okay? Next slide, I'll show you here, what's the outlook of our businesses? 50% said of the CEOs in, in under this survey said that um, they will still upskill. Good, my upskilling. Unfortunately, those, that upskilling will be on a selected group of people inside the company. And 37% of CEOs say that they will undergo workforce reduction. 37% of CEOs said that they will, they will undergo automation, field force automation, and so on. So what we've been discussing, and I've been hearing earlier about the fourth industrial revolution, it's here, it's, right, it's happening right now. Um, so we really have to do uh, things to turn this around quickly. And in a crisis, the buzzword that I've been hearing is about a, a, a circuit breaker. No, I don't want a circuit breaker. My analogy here is a boost, a nitro boost for those who are familiar with this. Okay, something that can boost us forward and keep us sustained, speeding forward. And yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can. Now, a new EdCom. I thought about this. Parang systemic yung, yung education. It's very complex. But then again, if we do these principles, it, an EDCOM should be strategic, inclusive, resilient, and systemic. And I tried an exercise uh, to design a, 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 a strategy map, a policy map. Ano bang makikita natin? Is it too daunting? Nakakatakot ba talagang tingnan yung education reform? Okay. And here are the existing resources that I use for this exercise. And we have the depth ed, um, international studies, and so on. And I found out, no, the answer is, as, as Kong Roman said, there are many low-lying fruits, low-hanging fruits. There are already um, reforms that are already um, in the pipeline. And only ref some, some reforms are even at the implementation at the school level. So I found out that we can have at least four objectives under one goal. And the goal is to achieve in, 24, in 2030 SDG4, Sustainable Development Goal 4 by 2030. To do that, we, will have, we need at least to have four objectives. And this is what we've been hearing all uh, afternoon long. Get the right people, 
to become teachers, attract the best uh, to become teachers, our current teachers and develop them into effective instructors. And on the learner side, put a system, a place, put a system in place so that every learner is able to benefit from the excellent instruction provided by the teachers. And objective four, finally, is to strengthen the commitment for educa an education governance system, something that, can capture, that encapsulates uh, the sustainability of this reform agenda. So let me look, look at this, objective number one, okay? Attracting uh, the best people to become teachers, right? So I've been hearing about this, improving teacher welfare and creation of a model of a pathway for teacher recruitment. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I tried to encircle this one. It's already in, 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 in Congress, in TEC bill. It's already in uh, the lower house and in the Senate. And I believe um, it, can, it can be passed. I think this is already in the plenary. Right. Let's go to objective number two, so that our teachers will become effective instructors. Okay, so we develop teachers to become academic leaders, and we teach at the right level. So look at look here, our school level solutions, and apparently increasing reading instruction time, and I've heard this a lot about read, read, read. The same as have been a recommendation. Um, since 2019, the EGVA 2019, increasing, reduction, increasing reading instruction time. So these are reforms that can happen in the school level. And yes, DepEd is already conducting or having the DepEd NEAP transformation to address these uh, policy measures. See? Anjana. Objective number three. Okay? Ensure that our learners benefit from excellent instruction. So you ha I have here the first two boxes, kinder and junior and senior high school age. Because the enrollment rates in these segments needs to improve. Maganda na tayo sa, 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 basic edu sa basic education grade school level. But in these areas, kinakailangan natin improve. And guess what? The policy measures beneath, beneath them are already in place. But we need to improve implementation. And these measures per literature are cost effective to improve lace. And then we have the, the learning inputs, quality textbooks, modules, complements, instruction, etc. Objective number four, something that captures and the commitment of, uh, of everyone of government uh, and all sectors to pursue uh, education reform, and that is the governance framework. So we see here community involvement in school management, um, increasing allocation to education, ending optimum education service mix, public and private education. Hey, Senate Bill 1579 na yan, yung sinasabi ko. Right? And this is what we what uh, uh, Survey Rene Raya was saying earlier, the commitment for a nuclear education investment. And this is what an EDCOM 2 is all about. Encapsulating everything in different systems and putting them into one clear strategic roadmap. And it will be able to monitor and evaluate this reform plan when it is implemented. No, we don't want another 30 years, right? This is something that can be done immediately. Um, most of this, as, as, as I presented, are already there. Just needs improvement in, in implementation. So let me close by saying what we need is a boost and a sustained strategy. I've heard this about a while ago from Senator Winga uh, Chalian, that EDCOM2 is the vehicle for this boost and sustained strategy in education. Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Again, that's uh, Mr. Marco de los Reyes, the Policy Advocacy Manager of the Philippine Business for Education, or PBED. So we're done with all our reactors. Pasalamatan po natin yung apat nating reactors for this afternoon's event. No, una si Senator uh, Wynga Chalian, and then din po si Representative Roman Romulo, 
and then Mr. Rene Raya from Social Watch Philippines, and again, Mr. Marco De Los Reyes uh, from IBED. Um, Batiin lang po natin lahat din po ng nanonood sa ating Facebook Live mula sa Facebook ng DepEd Philippines, ng CLCB, UPNC PAG, at ng Social Watch Philippines. I think meron na doon roughly 1,000 viewers po sa ating Facebook Live ng Social Watch Philippines. So uh, I think roughly 4,000 to 5,000 na po ang nanonood sa ating uh, forum ngayong hapon na ito. At huwag na rin po natin pataglin, let's go to the next part of our program, which is the virtual roundtable discussion. So we're, go we're going to have two rounds of roundtable discussions. And to facilitate the first round, allow me to introduce our moderator. He is an assistant professor, college secretary, and the director of the Center for Public Administration and Governance Education, UPNC PAG. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Reginald Ugedan. Sir, good afternoon po. All right. Habang hinihintay po natin. He... Now and good. Yeah, magandang hapon po sa atin lahat. Uh, I think I was able to have the, the audio while I was still muted. Magand muli po, no? magandang hapon po sa atin lahat. Um, welcome to this virtual dialogue. I, actually, it's a, a sort of conversation no, that we are going to, to have with our country's education executives. Right? For this first round of, of dialogue, um, we will no, we, of course we will have um, Secretary Leonor uh, Magdolis Briones, the the Deputy Secretary, no? and also here with us is Chairperson um, Prospero uh, J. Prospero de Vera no? of the Commission on Higher Education, and Executive Director Rosalina S. Constantino of the Planning Office, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, and um, of course now we are inviting them. We we will have them in this um, in this conversation so that they may be able to provide us a clear picture a clear picture and of course a deeper discussion of the state of the education in the country and possibly we can have the you know to, to contextualize you know, the the findings of the education education commission report of 1991 okay so um can can we have our our um this thing just uh yeah so mulipon magandang hapon so I'll just be throwing questions you know, to our to our um, expected uh, panelists for this um, for this round of conversation. Um, the first question, maybe that we will that we might um, ask them, is that uh, you know from their perspective as well, you know, what is the the biggest challenge in the education sector at present? Um, also, maybe you can you can react on the uh, the do to the deep seated challenges you know, identified or articulated in the Adcom report. Um, resemble the present um, education concerns. Um, can we have our, our beloved Ed Secretary Briones first, and then Chairperson De Vera, and later on the Executive Director um, Constantino? Thank you um, very much. Uh, before I comment on the question as to uh, what is the biggest challenge um, confronting the education sector at present, let me share with you some clarifications. This study, this assessment of the implementation, impact, and implications of EDCOM 1 is a study commissioned by the Department of Education. We decided on this before the pandemic, before the proposal, to have an EDCOM 2. Uh, this is because we could see that we were already fulfilling some of our goals in uh, inclusive education. We had a 10 point program. And so uh, we said that it is time for us to pivot to quality. And this is part of our program of Educalidad. Before the pandemic, before the two bills on on uh, on edcom and so we told ourselves we why don't we start with the edcom find out how it was implemented and so on and so forth what the issues are as we are pivoting towards quality so right from the beginning 
our concern was quality because we were already starting to achieve the other goals as inclusive education, uh, improvement in the budget. Our budget increased by more than 30%. But I agree with Rene that it's not enough, of course, uh, considering uh, what is happening in, in other countries. So this commissioned study is a study commissioned by the Department of Education because the very institution which should have an interest in EDCOM, of course, obviously, is the Department of Education. And this is part of our pivot towards quality education. Quality, we had this uh, formula of KITE, K for further strengthening the K to 12 program, which we continued uh, further uh, <clears throat> improvement in uh, the uh, uh, learning environment because we knew that we will not be using the same type of physical infrastructures and learning resources, et cetera, et cetera, considering uh, the speed with which knowledge is changing, uh, the need for teachers of skilling and reskilling. Uh, I firmly agree uh, uh, with uh, my favorite uh, scientist, my favorite mathematician who said that wherever you have a brilliant student, you can be sure there is a brilliant teacher. So we're interested in focusing on upskilling and skilling the teachers. And fourth, engagement of stakeholders for support and collaboration. This is local governments, the parents and the uh, community. So uh, I would like to make this clear to avoid the usual conf confusions, the usual um, misimpressions uh, about, uh, about events in education. Now, uh, the question that you raised is what is the biggest challenge uh, for us? Of course, it is quality. The constitution mandates us to provide not merely education for all Filipinos, but quality education for each uh, Filipino uh, learner. And you have a related question, uh, whether those challenges articulated in the EDCOM report uh, are still uh, uh, of concern. Uh, Alex has already said that very clearly, 50% implementation, 50% non-implementation. So uh, it is still something to look at. Also, um, um, on the matter of trifocalization, I had just one sentence about it because uh, uh, the thinking is, well, nandiyan si trifocalization, uh, let's not mess around with it. Uh, it was a painful and messy process in the first place. Um, the trifocalization was implemented at the time when a very good number of countries were also going into uh, trifocalizing or, or, or dividing up various aspects of education. For example, Singapore, uh, for example, Malaysia or Indonesia or Thailand. And so many, uh, not really many, but a number of very important uh, countries in Southeast Asia were going into dividing up the education pie. Uh, what is the situation at present? In the case of Singapore, Singapore is, of course, united. The Minister of Education uh, sits also and, uh, and has a say on, on, on curriculum, pre-service, in-service, and, uh, and everything else. A good number of those who went into trifocalization are back to uh, unity uh, structural arrangements. Out of 10 Southeast Asian countries, seven have unified structures. That's all that I will say. I will not comment in the case of the Philippines because uh, the thinking is that uh, uh, it's already a done deal. Uh, but we trifocalized at a time when uh, a good number of countries in Asia were into trifocalization or dividing themselves up into two. And now they are back as one. Uh, seven out of seven out of 
then. Now, um, also, um, uh, the point of, um, of, of power being delegated to principals, uh, I quite agree with it. And we will look into it uh, quite uh, seriously. But we also don't want to um, endanger also the, the power and the initiative that we should also be giving to the teachers as they try to make their teaching more uh, effective. Uh, I quite agree with the possibility and with or without a uh, with or without an EDCOM2, um, the research uh, findings or the research capacities of PIDS can be uh, utilized even as they are suggesting uh, other um, experts. I'm particularly uh, impressed and I totally agreed. I agree with the uh, observation and the uh, warning of Senator Gatsalian that we have to be um, sensitive to uh, possible overlap of executive and legislative functions. As a matter of fact, uh, I was thinking of raising the issue, um, what are the limits, what are the extent to which uh, executive uh, legislative functions will overlap or will unite or will oversee all were regulate because there is always that very dynamic push and pull. We know that historically in legislative executive relationships, you always have that dynamic push and pull between the executive and the legislature. And I'm very glad that uh, no less than a senator has uh, has seen and, and recognized that possibility. As for the comments of uh, Congressman Romulo, I totally, totally, if it is possible to say 150 or 200% agree with the, uh, with the formula of reading, reading, reading. As a matter of fact, only this week, we launched our Brigada Escuela. Now, Brigada Escuela, as all of us know, is generally associated with cleaning up the schools. We still clean up the schools and preparation for opening our uh, the school uh, <clears throat> uh, calendar and so on. But this time, our Brigada Escuela, considering that we are into blended learning, will be focusing more on reading. So ang motto namin dito sa Brigada Escuela ay pagbasa. What I'm just trying to say is that, as pointed out by Mr. Mark, many of the things that you are contemplating and suggesting for education are also being thought about, are also being implemented, and are also being programmed by the department uh, itself. Like the review of the of, of EDCOM, which we started over a year ago, before the pandemic, before the two bills, because we saw that there was a need for quality even before PISA, before the results of PISA came out. And by the way, you all know that the PISA results came out two years ago, and this was uh, duly reported to the public. And so I, I, I really agree with this reading, 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 reading. And this is very, uh, uh, for me, this is very important because it's reflected. It's not so much because it is reflected in the international assessments, but it is important for our learners. It is important for uh, for uh, the development uh, of our country. It's not enough to know how to read. And what is more important is to comprehend what is being read by the by our uh, uh, learners and our students. And um, the point also of uh, Congressman Romulo on guidance counselors, I think all of us are aware of the problem. One cannot be a guidance counselor without a master's degree. But the starting salary of a guidance counselor is practically the same as that of a of a teacher uh, without a master's uh, without a master's degree, and the attractions of the private sector are much more impelling uh, than perhaps uh, what the public sector can offer to guidance counselors. This requirement of a master's degree to qualify for for the function of guidance counseling uh, is a 
major uh, consideration, especially in relation to the salaries. We uh, correctly worry about the salaries of our teachers, but we should also worry about the salaries of our guidance counselors and the other uh, employees of government, like the accountant, like the economist. And we have been doing studies comparing also their salary, salary uh, levels. Trusting in the teachers, of course, we trust in the teachers. Now, um, so um, this uh, uh, webinar uh, starts from the assumption. There are two assumptions here unstated. One uh, is that we have a crisis in education. Only the other day, we had a very uh, interesting debate in our uh, Exicom and our Mancom. Do we have a crisis in education? And I clearly uh, recall what my predecessor said in 2020 when I asked him the same question, along with uh, the other former secretaries of education. We were together at that time to celebrate the anniversary of InnoTech, which is part of the Southeast Asian um, uh, Innovative Technology uh, Center uh, sponsored by the Philippines. And his answer at the time was, was, it's not so much a crisis as a, as a uh, persistent, as a chronic illness, which somehow never goes away. And of course, EDCOM 1 has also stated, has also observed as early as 1991, that education at that time was already in a continuing decline. So uh, the question and the assumption that we have a crisis, because if a crisis, eh, you're already at deathbed. Uh, you are already uh, ano ba yung sa covid na um, lalagyan ka na ng all sorts of gadgets etc uh, very very desperate uh, situation which might result in death or annihilation so uh, you, you, uh, that, that that's a very interesting issue and as i said we were debating about that only the other day do we have a crisis or do we have a chronic illness or are we having a decline as pointed out in uh, EDCOM, uh, EDCOM 1, a decline which has not stopped at all, a decline uh, on the incline. <laughs> okay. And um, the second assumption is that uh, we're going to have an EDCOM 2. Maybe at the same time, for the sake of, but then we don't like discussions anymore. We don't like reflections anymore. We just want to go ahead and find solutions to the problems which are identified. Do we need an EDCOM, mm -hmm. an EDCOM 2 to be able to achieve what we have identified as serious problems in, uh, in education? Also, and finally, I, as I said, I go back to the comment of Senator Katsalian. Uh, that um, we, we have to uh, be uh, uh, sensitive because it, it's always, as I said, a very dynamic situation to, uh, to overlaps between executive and legislative uh, functions. And um, I, I'm glad that he brought this out. So, uh, ayon ang sabihin ko, uh, what is our most, what is our biggest challenge? Like all of us, I, we all agree, I believe, that the challenge right now is quality. There are others like infrastructure, uh, teaching, curriculum, etc. But you put them all together and the challenge is quality and which we should attend to because that is the mandate of the Constitution. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Secretary Biones, no, for, for that answer. Um, can we ask, Siguro, if... Um, if um, Chair Popoy is, is ready, um, maybe we can ask also his um, views on what is the biggest challenge maybe in the sector in the higher education at present. And um, um, what do you think about those um, deep-seated challenges mentioned in the 
in the report or the findings of um, Prof. Alex Brillantes and team, um, are they, do they resemble the, the same concerns or, or problems in our higher education? Well, the biggest challenge right now is COVID-19. Uh, and it is going to be here for some time. I think what COVID-19 has exposed is the fact that a lot of the things that we did not do, which we should have done in the past, are things that hounded us during COVID-19. We have uh, not invested as much in technology. We have not invested as much in technology-mediated learning in higher education. We have not uh, improved and expanded distance education as a learning approach and a system. And so when COVID-19 hit us, we were less prepared than similarly situated universities and countries uh, are. And so uh, since last year, we have been on a very uh, uh, you know, systematic uh, trying to catch up and adjust to the realities of COVID-19 by adopting a flexible learning policy. I have said that uh, even in the next school year and uh, after that, uh, flexible learning is here to stay as far as higher education is concerned. And we will see a system where universities will have to uh, determine the proper mix and match of learning delivery systems, appropriate to the health situation on the ground, the capability of their faculty and students, connectivity, their own uh, uh, capacity to do it. Uh, and it will be both a uh, challenge to a lot of universities, but also an opportunity for others to move forward. So universities that have invested in technology, that have uh, trained their teachers for technology-mediated learning, will have the capacity to push ahead faster than the others. Other universities will, uh, try, will do a catch-up uh, system to be able to maximize the opportunities of flexible learning. I have been going around all the regions uh, uh, physically. I have covered all the regions in the country, even at the height of the pandemic, uh, through my PADJAP uh, system. And I know what is happening on the ground. I have interviewed uh, uh, test beneficiaries. I have talked to local governments. I have talked to universities. I have a pretty good feel of what are the challenges at the ground level because I have been going around continuously for seven months now at the ground level. And that, to me, that is the biggest challenge because it's not only improving on connectivity and technology. We'll now have to adjust the curriculum. We'll have to review the curriculum. We'll have to review learning outcomes. We'll have to create the better systems of accreditation. We will have to target uh, government investments in uh, public and private universities accurately to help those that are a little bit behind to move faster and also get the uh, universities that are doing very well to help the other less, less, less uh, uh, you know, the university, the universities with less capacity to improve. That is what we are uh, putting a lot of effort now, harnessing experts, uh, technical panels to develop uh, flexible learning uh, curriculum. Uh, we have been able to start uh, limited face-to-face -face classes in medicine and allied health sciences. And so far, it has worked. There, there is very minimal infection for the universities that have been, uh, that have been uh, allowed to open for limited face-to-face. -face. So the flexible learning in that system is a combination of online and face-to-face -face and offline and face-to-face -face for the universities. But you've got to change the whole regime, the whole approach in higher education because of that, all the way to preparing for licensure tests, uh, all the way to admission systems, you know. Admission systems in higher education now, uh, you know, are very challenging. You know, that UPCAT for the first time uh, does not have a test. 
And uh, these are very challenging times for higher education. So to me, that is the biggest challenge right now that we are adapt adapting to. No? Now, in terms of uh, my comments on the EDCOM report, I support completely uh, what, uh, what uh, Congressman Romulo had said. Uh, most of the discussions today is really on K-12. There's very little discussion on higher ed. So I wouldn't want to comment on the K-12 issue, uh, but agree with the uh, manifestations of Representative Romulo, of uh, Secretary Briones on challenges in K-12. But for higher ed in particular, I think the biggest difference between 1991 when the EDCOM was made and today is that there are many realities today that were not there in 1991. And therefore, one cannot use the same lenses and parameters in 1991 to now look at Philippine higher education. For one, the biggest challenge is really internationalization. Mm. Everything that you do in higher ed now cannot be located exclusively within your national boundaries. Every development in higher education is done in a global context. You talk about student mobility. You talk about mutual recognition of degrees. You talk about having registry of recognized universities. You talk about qualifications framework. You talk about transnational education. All of these things that are now in higher education cut across the political boundaries of the country. We produce manpower now, not just for the domestic market, but for the global market, because we have to produce ASEAN engineers. Our curriculum must be consistent with the Washington Accord. There are accreditation systems that cut across political boundaries. And so uh, everything that you do now uh, are discussed in a global context. And any reforms in higher education must be viewed within a global context, within internationalization. Our universities have to compete with the rest of the world. Uh, the uh, rankings are now the barometer that are used when universities talk to each other. When I meet with my, with my counterpart ministers in other countries, and when we bring Philippine universities and international universities across the table for possible university to university linkages, their first question is, what is the international rank of the universities that you are bringing with you? Uh, that is now the determinant of discussions. And one cannot uh, veer away from that when you look at developments in higher education. So that is the biggest difference between 1991 and 2021. So while we do agree that when you look at Philippine higher education, it, mu it must be taken in the context of uh, K-12 and PVET, what distinguishes higher education to me is the global aspect of this. That is now what drives higher education. Uh, all over the world, the countries are changing their policies. They are changing their laws for transnational education. We just passed our transnational education recently. Malaysia in preparation for ASEAN integration in 2005 changed their national laws to allow UK universities and foreign universities to set up campuses in their, in their country. They're packaging themselves as the transnational capital in the region. And so when you go to EDU, when you go to uh, the, uh, the uh, development area in Malaysia, between Malaysia and Singapore, it is called EDU City, you see there, uh, UK universities uh, campuses looking exactly like the campuses in the UK. And the ones who run it are not uh, Malaysians. These are international, uh, international uh, uh, faculty members, including Filipinos, including British uh, nationals. Uh, and the students there don't look like Malaysians. They are also international students. 
So this is what is happening uh, in globalization in many parts of the world. And when we do have uh, a review of higher education, that must be the new framework when we look at higher education. Thank you. Can I ask, can I, can I have a follow-up question? Um, 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 it, it has something to do with the, the, you know, uh, the trifocalization or the, of the education system. I, I think um, um, sec, um, um, Briones also have discussed a while ago the, the trifocalized um, system of education. I just want also to, to have your thoughts on this. Is this still relevant or um, do we need to, to re-examine this or, or of course look at the, the appropriateness right, or the relevance of the, this system to address issues in education in our country? Well, it is a very valid area to consider, given the fact that in 1991, it might have been a good idea in 1991, the perception being that the educational bureaucracy was big, cumbersome, it was not responsive to governance challenges, and therefore the answer was to trifocalize it. But if you look at what our ASEAN neighbors did, uh, many of them are not trifocalized now. But one must remember that one of the most difficult challenges in implementing the EDCOM report was trifocalization. Because I remember uh, Armand Fabelia was adamantly against separating you know, a higher education from basic education. If you read his, uh, his memoirs, you can read how contentious and how political difficult it was to do that, to create TESDA and CHED in 1994. Uh, while it is a valid issue to think about putting them together, I think uh, it will be messy, it will be politically contentious, and maybe our energies are better put on other more important issues in educational reform than trying to put back the agencies together. I think, uh, I, I think uh, uh, it is a good area to discuss and study, but putting it together, uh, putting it back together is something else. Uh, it is going to be difficult. And as I said, our energies may be better spent addressing more important concerns in education. Thank you very much, um, Chair Popper, for the answer. Now, let's proceed with, uh, with Executive Director um, Rosalina. We, 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 can, we can also look at the perspective or the issues. I'm confronting the, the, the TVET or the Technical Education and Skills Development, or particularly with, with TESTA, right, with that, um, uh, the TVET sector. Uh, what are the, the challenges and um, what do you think on those um, the deep-seated challenges as well? Are they reflective or are they uh, present as well in the, the event sector? Um, Executive Director Rosalina. Ma. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Reggie. Uh, my respects to uh, Secretary Liling and Chair Popoy de Vera and also Professor Berliantes. Um, for for TESDA, uh, let us use uh, uh, the lens on economic development. Uh, we live in a devocad world. We live in a disruptive, volatile, and certain complex, ambiguous, and diverse world. And with that, the biggest challenge in Tibet is that we have experienced a lot of disruptions, a lot of uh, technology transformations, and uh, we have uh, to adapt to that. Uh, we see Tibet um, as in a um, more uh, advanced countries as a contributing factor to economic development. And so with that, uh, we, we really see that uh, all of our standards, all of our training regulations in, in TVET should be more um, attuned or aligned to the requirements of the industry. However, with the, with the constantly evolving uh, world of work uh, and now with the pandemic and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, so what, what they're saying is that it's just a dress rehearsal to future pandemics. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, the fourth industrial revolution has actually um, accelerated our need to adapt to it. So with that, uh, we, that is the challenge that the Tibet sector is facing, that we have to be to, to transform TESDA to be a more demand-driven organization. 
we have from the very start uh, developed all our training regulations in partnership with our industry partners. However, since it's capital intensive, uh, we only see 60 to 70 percent utilization of our training regulations. So we have reforms already that are in place right now to uh, help uh, the organization adapt to this fast changing uh, technology the fast change, the ever-evolving labor market. Uh, we, we um, in first instance, the, the, the standards that we have, uh, we have to incorporate not only the technical skills, but also the social-emotional skills and the STEM skills, because we want to uh, develop 4.0 um, equipped learners. We want to future-proof our learners so that they will be able to adapt to, to the changing world of work. They would be able to pro uh, solve the problems that are not yet there and be ready for, for jobs that are not yet created. So with that mindset, we have to really work hand-in-hand uh, in hand with our industry boards. We have to uh, make sure that, that all their requirements uh, the, the roadmaps that they are developing in terms of uh, developing their, their industry or their sector. Uh, we have to, to be in close uh, coordination with them so that uh, all the products and services that they would want to, to further enhance or develop, we would be able to supply all the learners or the graduates who possess the right competencies and the skills that would help them qualify for the jobs that would be able to produce those products and services. Second, the curriculum. We have to make it uh, more adapt adaptive to this uh, digital transformation, the digitization and digitalization uh, uh, paradigm that we are in. So uh, we have to make sure that uh, also our learning facilitators are adapting to this, this uh, era of digital transformation. Uh, it is not enough that they are equipped with, with the methodology on how to teach or they, they possess the technical skills. They also have to have the digital skills so that they would be able to uh, teach uh, through, through online or blended learning. Uh, they would have to be able to create content that would help the learners uh, be able to achieve or acquire competencies even if there would be limited face-to-face uh, learning uh, sessions. Uh, the equipment, the, the tools, the, the equipment, the training facilities, these should also be adapt uh, adaptable to, to the changing world of work. They have to be able to uh, produce um, rightfully skilled uh, work learners so that, so meaning we have to have facilities that would uh, have fourth industrial revolution technology. Uh, we have been uh, strengthening our partnerships with inter industries, with enterprises, so that they would become our training partners. Based on our study of the employment of Tibet graduates, they, uh, it is said that 70% of, of the uh, enterprise-based training graduates are employed. However, there's a small percentage share in the total Tibet graduates. So we really have to work with them closely so that we would be able to to produce more uh, learners that would be more employable and more productive in the workplace. Um, and of course, we have to be able to uh, have uh, systems and processes on how we will be able to uh, recognize the assessment uh, or and certification systems that our industry partners are, are developing. Um, right now, we, uh, we have... Um, develop or, or we have reformed in our Tibet systems to adapt the area-based and demand-driven Tibet, wherein the, our industry partners would be able to determine their, uh, the needs that they would, the, the skills requirements that they would uh, have uh, in, in their areas of, uh, in their respective areas. So it would not be a centralized way of developing the standards, but it would be more relevant, more agile. It would be more flexible and uh, we would be able to also recognize the, the vendor certificates that are available in the market. As to the tri-focalization, um, I agree with 
Chair Popoy, that uh, it would be a really tedious process if we would dwell into that. Um, as a matter of fact, because of the EDCOM 1 recommendation, the Tibet sector has elevated its image. Uh, the Tibet graduates somehow uh, uh, are not seen as second-class citizens and that uh, with, with the context, with, with the principle of lifelong learning, Tibet is strategically uh, placed there so that we would be able to reskill, upskill uh, our, our workers. So even if they are uh, bachelor degree, degree holders or even if they are uh, out of school youth, uh, through Tibet, they would be able to, to upskill or reskill themselves and help them in the pro uh, vertical and horizontal career progression. So uh, my take on this is that for, for uh, the trifocalization issue, I, I just want to um, uh, let us just focus on, on strengthening the existing systems, processes, and mechanisms for the entire education sector instead of uh, um, uh, focusing our energy on consolidating the three uh, education agencies. That's all, Dr. Ejim. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Executive Director um, um, Rosalina. I think you know, we want to have more conversation. No? Um, sayang, no? itong pagkakataon that the, the Secretary of DepEd, uh, Secretary Briones, um, Chair Popoy, and Executive Director um, Rosalina Constantino is here with us no? to discuss um, the, the current issues or concerns in education sector. Maybe um, I'll just ask you for a, um, a, a quick or maybe a short um, conclusion or maybe a message you know, to most of our our conversation, maybe more on um, what is the future of education? I mean, on your particular sector that you are looking at, maybe, or, or how you envision right, the, the particular sector. Um, we can maybe start with um, Executive Director Rosalina. Next, we'll have um, Chair Popo and um, later on, um, Secretary Lili. Thank you, Dr. Reggie. So for TESDA, we have our, our, all our policies, programs, and projects are all anchored on the two-pronged strategy of Tibet for global competitiveness and workforce readiness and Tibet for social equity and poverty reduction. These strategies guide us to be forward-looking to ensure that we meet the skills needs of our constituents now and in the future and to ensure that we do not leave anyone behind in terms of access to quality Tibet programs. We are also guided by the findings and recommendations of the Tibet sector study, which was a uh, uh, prepared and um, published by the Asian Development Bank together with TESDA, which measured how the sector is uh, doing and how it should position itself in the coming years to address the challenges brought by the fourth industrial revolution, the rapid digital transformation, and most recently, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we look forward beyond 2022, TESDA's core programs shall be anchored on innovation, digitalization, digitization, social equity and poverty reduction, and the circular economy. We are emphasizing the significance of innovation as it helps increase the potential to respond to overcome disruptive challenges and transform the economy and society through dynamic skills provision, something that is highly crucial at our current situation. So, uh, also, in order for our workers, enterprises, and by extension, our economy to be resilient to the future shocks of the fourth industrial revolution, the fifth industrial revolution, and other potential disruptions, we shall be focusing on the following themes or priorities for the next cycle of our national PSD plan. First is new mindset, adopting critical thinking and innovativeness to adapt to the new normal in the fifth industrial revolution. Strengthen our digital capacity, especially our trainers' capacity in delivering flexible training. We have to develop more blended modules as well as expand or test the online program. Reskill and upskill existing workers and new entrants to the world of work. And restyle Tibet as the world of work is drastically changing, shifting to remote or hybrid forms of work. So does test the uh, Tibet need to be transformed as well. Tibet delivery should focus on industry partnership and collaboration. So that would be all, uh, Dr. Reg. Thank you very much, um, Thank you, Director Rosalina. Um, Chair Popoy, sir. What was the, what was the question? Um, just the a, a, a closing message. 
culture po ko. And oh, maybe well, uh, as far as higher education is concerned, we have gone into areas where nobody dared go into before. Uh, with education champions like uh, Senator Winda Chalian with us and President Rodrigo Rojo Duterte, 1.6 million young Filipinos today no longer pay tuition in miscellaneous fees in more than 200 public universities. 500,000 students are being assisted through the tertiary education subsidy and 300,000 get tulung, tulung dunung grants. In short, more than any other administration in the past, access to higher education has been an achievement of this administration. We have increased uh, the uh, participation rate in higher education to levels that are now comparable with our ASEAN neighbors like Thailand and uh, Malaysia. The uh, participation rate in higher education is more than 34% now. It was as low as 28% before free higher ed came in. Uh, looking back, of course, we did not know that when, the, when the RA10931 was passed, if we did not pass free higher ed, the impact of the pandemic on higher education would be worse now. You will see a lot of students would have stopped schooling because of the economic uh, problems in the pandemic and their families would not have money to pay for their tuition fees. At least we have survived the worst of the pandemic and enrollment in public universities have remained stable. And the tertiary education subsidy has become a lifeline for poor families, not just for their education needs, but for the needs of the family itself. Uh, we, have been we have included and welcomed local universities and colleges to the higher education family. There are more than a hundred local universities and colleges now uh, increasing the delivery mode for free, for free higher education across the whole country. The challenge therefore now is not access, the challenge is how do you ensure access to quality higher education? And uh, under the K-12 program, we have trained uh, more than 9,000 faculty members. Uh, almost 3,000 of them have, get, have gotten their master's and PhD degrees. We continue to fund uh, the professional development of faculty members. Our universities, there are now 14 Philippine universities ranked among the best in Asia. When I came into chair, there are about four or five of them. We have more than doubled the number of universities that are now conscious of internationalization and are correcting uh, and adjusting so that they can compete not just within the country, but outside the country. Uh, these are some of the indicators of quality education. Uh, um, better credential teachers, uh, universities that benchmark themselves versus the best in the rest of the world, investments in uh, smart campuses, which we are doing now. And we thank Congress for continuously funding. Of course, we need more money, uh, paging uh, Senator Gachalian. We need more money for higher ed, but whatever is given to us, we make sure we spend it. In Bayanihan too, CHED has a 99% utilization rate for Bayanihan for funds. Whatever is given to us, we spend. Now, the challenge, as I have said, is in these difficult times, we have to adjust to the realities of COVID-19, creating smart campuses, uh, making teachers adjust to flexible learning, helping our students, uh, et cetera. Uh, particularly on the issue of connectivity. I've gone around the country and the number one problem of all the students is really connectivity. When they listen to their teachers, they cannot understand the lecture. Sometimes the signal drops and they're afraid to ask their teachers to repeat the lecture because their teachers might get angry. Uh, they spend too much on load. One asynchronous class uh, already use, utilizes 100 pesos of load for students. This is far too expensive and really affects uh, access to education. So that, that is what we are working on to uh, uh, adjust uh, uh, to the pandemic, to uh, be able to continue learning. And uh, I thank our public and private universities for staying the course, even at the worst of times. We have very good higher education institutions in this country. The policy of flexible learning is really because we believe 
that you just have to guide them. On their own, they can be very good in delivering education. So that has been our philosophy as far as the commission is concerned. Thank you. Maraming salamat, um, Chair Popoy. Now, uh, can we have our untiring secretary, um, Leonor, uh, be honest, ma'am? Thank you. Uh, I think you're asking what, what the future yes. will be like. Uh, precisely, uh, I always joke and say that I am the oldest in the Deep Ed family, but I have the youngest ideas. Two years ago, we already started our Education Futures Unit because we in Deep Ed could see that many of what we are teaching, many of what we are dealing with, the things, how we teach, how we handle our students, how we build our classrooms, the kind of gadgets we use are continually uh, changing. And uh, as we all know, we're trying to develop critical uh, thinking, communications, collaboration and creativity uh, among our, our learners. What is the future going to be like? You know, the future is unpredictable. We are preparing our learners for a future which we are not completely sure of, which we cannot totally predict, where we have incomplete data. We are planning on on issues, on matters, on developments of which um, we are not uh, completely in control. So uh, we, are, we have to prepare our children for unpredictable and unpredictable future. At present, you know, we teach our children to prepare themselves to become engineers or to become accountants or painters, or dancers, but now, but now uh, we cannot say that uh, may, uh, we, we, we cannot say that uh, a doctor preparing a, a human to be a doctor might be a better, might be better than having a, a gadget which continually monitors the state of a person's body. People are now talking about robot teachers, about brain implants. And so the, the change is the most uh, threatening uh, aspect of what we see as the, even the, the near future. And secondly, we have to deal with technology. Uh, all of us agree that um, technology is developing and changing um, uh, all the time. And our learners have to be uh, uh, prepared uh, for this. But at the same time, we have to remind them that they are humans, that they are not robots, and that they have a history. They belong to a country, and they have their culture, and they have their ways of thinking and doing, which are different from what technology teaches us. So one, again, to summarize, the future is unpredictable. So we have to prepare our children, our learners, to deal with change. Because uh, people laugh at me when I say that by the time that our learners graduate, whatever we have taught them will have changed already. And so we have to prepare our learners for that. Not only must they learn new things, but they have to preserve what we now say as their mental balance, the ability to accept that there will be change, the things will be strange, that what we are now, what they will face in the future will not be learned from the textbooks of the past or of their school. That is the challenge and that is what we have to, uh, to implant uh, in our children as they go on either to higher education or to, to jobs. So dealing with technology, staying human, maintaining your mental stability and accepting change or differences and predictability, not knowing what is going to happen next and still 
staying on course and still having the confidence to overcome that is the challenge that we have to face for basic education. Thank you. With that, maraming salamat, um, uh, Secretary Briones, um, Chair Popoy, and Executive Director Rosalina for raising this, uh, this virtual dialogue. Um, so maraming salamat po sa inyong aktibong pag, uh, pag-participate. I have seen a lot of, of comments or in our chat box chat box, no? but um, maybe we can have later on the chance to, to ask those questions if we still have time. So with this, um, um, we end our roundtable discussion one, and I um, pass it on again to, to Lester. Maraming salamat po. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reginald Ogadan, for facilitating the first roundtable discussion. Wag na po nating patagalin. Let's go now uh, to the second roundtable discussion and allow me to introduce our moderator. She is an associate professor of the National College of Public Administration and Governance, UP Diliman, and the co-convener of Social Watch Philippines. Please welcome oh, Dr. Maria Victoria Rapiza. Hi, ma'am. Good afternoon po. Um, good afternoon. Uh, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Uh, a welcome to this dialogue with education stakeholders. Uh, where we have uh, a range of excellent speakers with us this afternoon. As you know, participatory governance is not just a buzzword. We know that development outcomes, whether in education, in health and other social services, including other sectors, are significantly improved. If and when citizens, especially those who are most affected, uh, their views are taken into account, they are consulted so that they're actually able to shape public policy making. It is in that spirit that we have invited uh, representatives uh, from very important sectors in the education uh, realm to join us because we know that this forum will be incomplete without the voices, the perspectives, the dreams, the aspirations, the issues as well as the recommendations uh, of those who, who are most affected no? by, by many of the challenges that confront the education sector. Uh, I am very proud, I'm very pleased to present with us this afternoon uh, our sharers or speakers. We have Dr. Milwida M. Guevara, Chief Executive Officer of the Synergia Foundation. Uh, we have Professor Flora Adeliano, President of the Education Network Philippines. She's uh, also an active member of a Teachers Association. We also have with us uh, this afternoon, Mr. Elijah San Fernando, who is a Vice President of the Freedom from Debt Coalition and former student regent of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. So good afternoon ho sa ating lahat. Welcome. Great to see you here. Okay. So um, let me start by asking the, you know, a kind of similar question that was raised uh, with our education management people earlier on. No? Um, basically, uh, what do you think are the, what do you think is the biggest challenge no, to the education sector at present? We heard the findings uh, presented to us earlier this morning, um, uh, well, this afternoon, early this afternoon. And uh, we heard the ensuing conversation that happened afterwards, including some of the very substantive thoughts of many of our leaders around the Zoom table, if you like. So did any of these resonate? Are we missing something still? Um, we'd like to hear your thoughts, what you think are, is there a challenge you would like to further affirm and, and build on, or is there something new you would like to introduce? And what do you think are important recommendations moving forward? Maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Milvida Guevara. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting us. I think we left out a very important uh, sector in education, and that is the local governments. You know, the special education fund that is raised by local government is 15% higher than the MOOE of DepEd that is given to schools. And the local school boards actually have an important mandate, except that uh, they are not given the autonomy and uh, they are not given the freedom and probably the capacity building is not there. So 
many opportunities are wasted because the local school boards are not uh, considered an integral partner. We look at local governments as financier instead of bringing in their expertise in management, resource mobilization, and mobilizing the community. You know, we work very much with the local governments. And if they are really informed, they are involved in planning, implementing, and evaluating the performance of students, they can really be a great asset. So I'd like to say also that we also keep, for example, in 2004, the Human Development Report already mentioned that we failed to mobilize the involvement of communities and parents. And up to now, their participation is very nominal. They are also looked at as advisors, financiers, but they are not deeply involved in planning and implementation. I'd like to support the idea of Father Nebres that we should, the first thing that if ever we're going to form another commission is for us to listen to the ground roots, no? Because I think our education system is very centralized and therefore communities have very, very little opportunities to contextualize. Teachers, for example, just receive uh, mandates, uh, memoranda from uh, the central office, and they really have very little freedom to be able to contextualize the curriculum relative to the needs and the demands of the, of the students. And I think uh, that is something that, I mean, considering that Philippines is 7,100 islands, and you know, I worked with the central government for 25 years, and it's very impossible for the central office to really anticipate to respond to the various needs of communities because they have various they have various needs and i think to be able to give the community schools the local governments flexibility to be able to uh, develop school programs that their children their students uh, need that would be very important i'd also like to stress uh, the point made by uh, congressman romalo I think we should really focus on the needs of basic education, elementary school students starting from kindergarten, because if they miss the development of good reading skills, good mathematics skills, character education, and the ability to solve problems, the foundation is going to be very weak and those weaknesses will progress to more serious problems when they go to senior high school. You know, yesterday I was talking with Father Nebras because we assess the competencies of children during the distance education. And, you know, the high school students perform below average. Even they could not answer five out of 10 questions correctly. Some of them, when they are in grade 10, could only answer three out of 10 questions in mathematics. They're very poor in fractions, very poor in decimals, very poor in solving problems. Why? Because they were not taught mathematics very well when they were in elementary. They could not also uh, construct very good sentences. Why? Because they were not taught very good English or very good Filipino when they were in the elementary. So I think the focus should really be strengthening basic education by giving local governments, their communities, and the teachers and schools deeper involvement in planning and implementation. Great. Maraming salamat. May I call on um, Professor Flora Arellano? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, these are my insights. No? Um, as I've been um, listening to the report of uh, the UPTM, uh, I think we should take stocks of the results of these assessments of the Philippine education system and the recommendation posed uh, by the EDCOM 1991 and link it to the current issues, problems besetting our education system. Now, uh, the cornerstone of what we have been discussing lies in the quality of education. So here, uh, I would like to raise the issue of inaccessibility and inadequacy of the education system. 
it's really a big problem right now. And a large number of students or learners are left behind. In fact, the recent uh, PSA report um, regarding OSY, it rose to 10 million in this time of pandemic. But prior to pandemic, there is already an increasing dropout rates. But this time, it is increasing, you know, um, making it more or less 10 million. Now, children in schools, you no, know, but not learning is an issue of inadequacy. Yes, there are students, there are learners in schools, but we have heard, no, uh, like what Dr. Gibar had said, they read, but they don't comprehend. Even um, Congressman Romulo no, had stated it. So they are, he, they are there in school, uh, present in school, but not learning. So this is an issue of inadequacy. Of course, there are multiple and overlapping uh, inaccessibility and inadequacy issues like poverty kasi mahalagang problema itong poverty to address this every reform should serve to strengthen public education system from framework policies programs and increase public financing to expand public provisioning and improving quality so when, while we welcome a comprehensive review of the education system and identify the issues and problems, we are also worried considering some of the significant outcomes of EDCOM 1, though largely felt and seen in the higher education, where we saw diminishing role of the state or the government in provision, in terms of deregulation, privatization, and corporatization. If at all these are the issues we need to further revisit, review, and study. So here, uh, another issue that we see an important um, uh, concern that we need to address is about teacher education. From pre-service to in-service education and continuing professional development. Rethinking of responsive curriculum content and methodologies anchored on SDGs, particularly SDG 4 on quality education, and the ambition 2030 uh, to ensure the direction and content of education at all levels. Um, I would like to address also the issue of rethinking educational content and methodologies in the context of the use of new information technology posited by the fourth industrial revolution should be an agenda of the three sectors in education to ensure inclusive quality equitable education with emphasis on enhancing public education and regulation of private education Public education should not be compromised to the desired design and agenda of the youth investors in education right now that may pose the problem of intellectual property rights, production of software to the detriment of cultural diversity, values, and history of the Filipino people. So uh, we are we do subscribe no, that there is a need to learn the digital technology, especially right now no, in this COVID-19 pandemic. But then there should be a regulation also in terms of um, the uh, motives no, or the purposes of youth investors uh, going in into the, into the education um, landscape. Because education right now is a profitable business venture. That's why there are so many private uh, uh, owners of schools that are now 
uh, proliferating no, in our education system. And then, last one, um, the, the governance of the education system, um, I think there should be a harmony and uh, coordination of these three sectors in terms of directions and content of our educational system. Um, they should be concerned about the outcomes no, of our participation in the years that, ha that we have been uh, um, exposed no, or the years that we have been in the education system wherein the issue of declining quality is still a problem. So with this, if it, if it requires a mechanism, whether it is a, whether this is the National Coordinating Committee uh, for these three sectors or a mechanism for another one ministry, probably this will be an urgent concern of our legislative or executive body. Now, with, re, with regards to what um, Professor De Vera had said, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Popoy, about the internationalization of higher education and then the transnational education provisioning, um, my only um, concern here, we must be informed by uh, public interest concerns no, and objectives and not solely by the profit motives or market forces uh, being um, um, promoted no, by this um, um, transnational or uh, national border um, education system that we have been uh, working with. That's all. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for those uh, very provocative uh, comments and it really will trigger more discussions during the open forum. Elijah, uh, would you like to follow up on many of the points that we just heard and also responding to the question I posed? Mm -hmm. Particular po dun sa tanong na ano ang major challenge na inaharap ng edukasyon, yung education paradigm and system po mismo na tumatagus po from one administration to another. Ipagpaumenin niyo po pero almost everything from EDCOM 1 until now has virtually remained the same. While we recognize the victories that the advocates, thinkers, academics, people's organizations have gained, much still is needed to be done. The EDCOM 1 said, we have to improve the teaching capacity of our teachers by raising their wages. Pero hanggang ngayon, ito pa rin po ang issue natin. Mababa pa rin ang sahod ng mga kaguruan. Kulang-kulang pa rin ang mga beneficyong natatanggap. At kulang pa rin ang mga espasyo para sa makabuluhang partisipasyon ng kaguruan sa decision-making platforms and processes. Binanggit din po ng Ed EDCOMUAN na kailangang suporta at palakasin ng pampubliko at batayang edukasyon. Pero hanggang ngayon, ito pa rin po ang problema. May mga school buildings pero walang mga kagamitan. May mga paaralan sa mababa at mas mataas na antas pero nananatiling hindi accessible sa kalakhan ng mga mag-aaral. Nananatili pa rin excluded ang pinakamahihirap na sektor ng ating lipunan sa ating edukasyon. In 1996, European Commission President Jacques Jean Delors said, schools and school systems are being challenged to develop new educational paradigms. In 2021, naulit na naman po, sinabi ni UN Secretary General Guterres, we must take bold steps to create inclusive, resilient, quality education systems fit for the future. Ang nais nice ko lang pong diinan dito, from 1991 to 2021, it's always been business as usual. Sa konteksto ng pandemyang COVID-19, mas na-expose ang ganitong paradigm. Ang tinitindigan po natin dito, this should not continue. It is true that the Philippine educational system is not a system in isolation. Just like any other systems of education, it is open to risks and uncertainties. But the reality calls for a systemic reform that cuts across all aspects of the educational delivery structure. So that's my answer po to the question with regard to the challenges to education. So Elijah, you did not disappoint. I think you provoked more, you know, more thinking about, uh, about education sector and some of the critical issues that we need to confront. Now, you know, this segment is the part where 
we want voices from below to come through, voices from everywhere, not just below, from left to right, and everywhere, no? So I will provide now uh, the space for each of our speakers to further speak about what are the key messages in relation to education in terms of where it is, what are the challenges related to the sector that's closest to your heart, and again, um, ways forward. Uh, maybe this time I'll start with Flora. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, from the very start, since we were created as a civil society organization, ang amin pong um, uh, adhikain no? ay ipandila, ipromote ang education for all. Dahil malaki ang bilang ng mga marginalized, excluded, and vulnerable sectors na napag-iiwanan ng ating edukasyon. Kaya yan po ang aming um, banner slogan, banner theme, uh, yung inclusive, equitable, quality, and lifelong learning education for all. Yan po. Uh, specifically, uh, sa usapin po ng uh, equitable quality education, dahil nakikita namin ito ay isang human right ng bawat isa. Kaya manapakahalaga po na from pre-primary to kindergarten to tertiary with basic education as compulsory education. At dapat dito po yung issues on equity and inclusion ng mga marginalized, excluded, and vulnerable sectors coming from the out-of-school youth, mga persons with disabilities, indigenous learners, Muslims, children and youth in armed conflict and disaster situations, among others, dapat ito po ang mga maging saklaw ng ating education uh, delivery. At ang pangalawa po ay yung aming pagsusulong ng, mang, ng uh, alternative learning system. Ngayon po, batas na po siya. At uh, kaya lang, napakaliit ng pondo na nakalaan para sa kanya. Samantalang napakalaki ng bilang ng mga uh, nangangailangan ng mga out-of-school youth and adults ng uh, alternative learning system. So dito po, uh, ang isang advocacy po namin, kailangan merong relevant, culturally sensitive, diverse and community-based alternative learning system in the country to reach out to more marginalized learners, youth and adults. Kaya nga po dito isang binabandila namin ang pagkakaroon ng mga community learning centers na wala sa loob ng paaralan. Para ito yung venue ng pagtuturo, pagbibigay ng aral, aralin sa mga nasa uh, laylayan, yung mga wala sa uh, paaralan. Tapos po, sinusulong din namin ang child protection policies at uh, positive discipline in everyday, um, in everyday teaching. Maging sa parenting din po. Uh, dahil nakikita namin sa maraming issue ng child rights, uh, child uh, abuses, lalo na po yung mga anti-bullying, mga sexual molestation, and others. Mahalaga na ito'y na napoprotektahan ng ating mga stakeholders sa paaralan para hindi magkaroon ng mga child rights uh, violations. Tapos yung isang napakahalaga dahil ako po'y guro ay yung uh, pag implement po ng Magna Carta ng public school teachers. Lalo na ngayong pandemya, yung mga working conditions po namin na halimbawa po yung hazard pay, Lalo na ngayong panahon ng pandemya, tapos yung sandamakmak na sinabi nga pong mga sulatin, mga paperworks na dapat sana paperless na, ay ito yung mga dagdag na tensyon at trabaho na ginagampanan ng mga guro samantalang wala na silang uh, oras. Uh, Kung bagas ano ay limit, limitless, no? Yung usapin ng kanilang uh, working hours sa online teaching hanggang gabi po. May consultation na nagaganap sa pagitan ng mga mag-aaral at ng mga guro. Kaya nga po, mahalaga na balik, uh, balik, balik aralan po natin at uh, ating uh, i-implement yung sinasabi nating uh, rights and welfare ng mga guro sa pamamagitan ng Magna Carta for Public School Teachers. At uh, isang pinopromote din po namin yung disability inclusive education. Lalo na po sa ating mga Uh, persons with disabilities, 
yung mga learners with disabilities. Kailangan po dagdagan ng pondo ng mga learners natin with disabilities, lalo na po sa mga assistive devices, mga qualified teachers to teach, yung sa ating mga disability learners, at iba pa po. Ngayon po, mukhang uh, na-integrate yung budget nila sa general budget ng edukasyon, lalo na po sa basic. Kaya maganda po sanang tingnan natin ito dahil napakahalagang concern ito ng mga persons with, with disabilities. Tapos yung usapin po ng education, financing, and governance, yung, yung nabanggit nga po ni Elijah, kailangan po talaga increase investments, funding, financing para sa ating public education. Kahit malaki ang budget ng basic education, hindi po ito sumasapat dahil yearly lumalaki rin ang bilang ng mga mag-aaral at lumalaki ang pangapangangailangan na tustusan natin ang usapin ng, ng uh, education deficits na dapat ma-resolve ano, sa ating education system. Tapos po yung gender equality in education. Isa po ito sa aming sinusulong na magkaroon ng mga gender fair education um, instructional materials at maging uh, yung usapin ng uh, gender sensitivity sa hani ng mga guro. Yan po yung ilan sa mga um, aming uh, pinopromote bilang civil society organization sa pakikipagtulungan na rin po sa Departamento ng Edukasyon at uh, sa iba pang mga stakeholders na nagsusulong ng similar advocacy for an inclusive, equitable, and quality education for all. Yun lang po. Marami pong salamat. Maraming salamat for sharing your very comprehensive uh, and substantive uh, advocacies as the education sector. I will call now Elijah. All right. Uh, the current department po has introduced many reforms. Na eh. Naging kabahagi rin po yung mga ating civil society organizations and partners upang magbalangkas pa ng mas maraming reforma sa sistemang pang-edukasyon. Kailangan pong suportahan natin ito. Kailangan itong suportahan ng ating gobyerno. At ang pinakamaiging forma ng suporta po ay ang pinansya. So kailangan po nating tignan kung tumutugon ba tayo doon sa mga pandaigdigang kaisahan upang patatagin yung sistemang pang-edukasyon at tunay na mapuspos, malubos yung mga reforma na na-introduce na po ng kasalukuyang departamento. Halimbawa po nito, may rekomendasyon ang United Nations na ilaan ang 6% of gross domestic product sa budget ng edukasyon. Pero nakakalungkot po dahil sa kasalukuyan, 4% lamang ng kita ng ating bansa o ng ating gross domestic product ang inilalaan para sa Department of Education. Hindi pa po dito kasama ang ibang sektor ng ating edukasyon sa mas mataas na antas. Pangalawa, ang nais po naming edukasyon ay inclusive and child-friendly. At tingin ko po, dito ay patuloy na nag introduce ng mga reforms at patuloy ang pakikipag-usap ng departments sa ating mga civil society organizations upang maging inclusive and really child-friendly ang ating mga uh, paaralan. Kung, ma kung malala ang tama ng COVID-19 sa pangkalahatang populasyon ng mga mag-aaral, higit na malala ang epekto nito sa mga kapatid at kasama nating differently abled persons. Paano ang mga bulag? Paano mga pipi? Paano mga bingi ng mga kabataan? Kailangang tignan kung sapat at tumutugon ang mga espasyo para sa kanila. At ang pangatlo po at nais kong i-diin dito sa uh, ating talakayan ay marapat lamang po na tignan natin ang edukasyon bilang global common good at hindi tarangkahan para magkamal ng yaman. So yun lamang po. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyo. Uh, maraming salamat, Elijah. Please read that. Take it away. So, kami kasi, we work with local governments because we believe that they are at the forefront and they are in the best position to listen, to provide for the needs of the children. And uh, that is why we try and strengthen the local school boards. But borrowing the words of uh, Mayor Rex Gachalian, many of our local governments and local school boards are still archaic, Jurassic, and authority-centric. Huh? Kung mag-isip sila ng programa sa edukasyon, hiwa-hiwalay, desperate. Sample scholarship. So building, matutuwa na sila doon. Or providing school supplies, di ba? So what we need would really be 
mayors, governors, and uh, local school boards that think systemically, that think in terms of a holistic program. Because ang education, hindi lang siya building, hindi lang siya school supplies, hindi lang siya scholarship. Because the child needs good parents, needs good teachers, needs food, needs uh, very good uh, peace and security. Diba? So kailangan, pag, if you have to do an education program, it has to be 360 degrees. Borrowing again the program of uh, Mayor Rex Gachalian. And this really involves great community involvement. Alam mo, nakita ko yung chat na mayroong school governing council. Pero, you know, we work with about 426 local government. Yung school governing councils nila, very nominal. Kasi parang, ako, chairman ako ng school governing council sa amin, pero pumipirma lang ako sa SIP ng principal. We always talk of governance, education governance. The first characteristic of education governance is genuine participation. Listening, di ba? Yung hindi ka nagdidikta, talagang papakinggan mo what are the needs so that the programs can be based on the needs of parents and students and community, ordinary community folks, di ba? Para yung programa mo laan doon. Kaya nga, sabi ko, dapat medyo kailangan bigyan natin ng flexibility yung mga community. Because ang nangyayari, uh, kasi nga yung curriculum, you have to stick to it, do. And one of the problems of the curriculum, it's too laden with so many competencies. Kaya nagahabul yung teacher, nagmamadali. Hindi na nagkakaroon ng mastery kasi nga meron silang very rigid enforcement of what should be taught. Pero sabi ko nga, sige, dapat mastery lang. Pero syempre, sabi nila, ma'am, eh kasi ito po yung requirements. Eh. Kaya ang nangyayari sa mga local governments na magaling, Marami kaming magaling na local governments. No? Siyempre, Valenzuela yung number one doon. Uh, ano, talagang guerrilla tactic, remediation lang. Kasi wala silang magagawa. Eh. So, after school programs, Saturday program, or summer camps to be able to do remediation of what the students really need. So, kasi ang kailangan din sa alkalde, saka sa gobernador, data-driven. Ang problema kasi sa data natin, ginagamit lang natin for reports and for compliance. Yung data kasi, kailangan gamitin for analysis to find out what are the weaknesses of the children and to be able to do programs that answer these needs. Kung masyadong flexible yung ating uh, requirements, masyadong centrally driven, walang flexibility talaga yung schools to be able to analyze the needs and to develop programs that would uh, provide for these needs. Alam mo yung huli namin, uh, I, I, I just had, sabi ni Alex, ang dami na daw studies sa listening. So, kaso yung listening, genuine talaga yun eh. Dapat pinapakinggan mo at pinutupad mo yung kanilang rekomendasyon. I was talking to, uh, I had a Zoom workshop with high school students and sabi nila, nako ma'am, Ito pong history, ayaw na ayaw namin kasi wala nang ginawa kundi magmemorya ng date at saka ng mga tao, di ba? So sabi ko, e eh, paano ginagawa ninyo? E eh, eto ba, uh, wala namang, in, we always say parents are uh, should be the mentors, no? But actually, sabi nga nila, yung parents nila nagtatrabaho. So, sa Zoom workshop naman, hindi rin sila makapagtanong because nagmamadali yung guru, dapat matapos yun, no? Of, of course, Sabi nila, hindi po kami makapagtanong. We cannot actually ask uh, illustrations. Ha? So what do you do? Eh, sabi nila, nakuhopya na lang po kami sa magaling naming uh, kaklase. So yung mga yon, th- those are very, very uh, trivial things but they should actually be remedied. Alam mo, nag, uh, sabi nga namin, mga local governments namin, nag-assess ng competencies nila ng mga bata sa distance education. Yung iba hindi namin magamit. Kasi yung mga... Uh, sinabit lang nila yung talagang tataas na grade kasi ayaw nilang makita yung problema ng mga bata. Para bang nahihiya tayo na may problema tayo na hindi makabasa yung mga bata? Hindi tayo dapat mahiya, di ba? We should not be in a denial mode. These are the problems of students and we should face them and develop programs that will remedy their problems. So yun lang po. I'm, I'm really very, very demand-driven with respect to programs. Okay, maraming salamat. Um, 
we will need to end this uh, segment uh, of this uh, forum, but I would just like to highlight some of the incredibly insightful points that have been raised by our uh, very good speakers. Of course, uh, one conspicuous, uh, in con well, conspicuous missing actor here is local governments, no? because they play a very important role in implementation and education on the ground. And so um, um, Guevara has thankfully pointed out uh, that we need more inclusion and we need more, uh, we need more of the voice of the local government, including communities and parents in, in much of the design and the implementation issues uh, and in the evaluation, both at national and local level. Um, it was also pointed out by uh, Laura that while quality is an important issue, lalo na in the time of the pandemic, the issue of inaccessibility has become, you know, of education has become uh, a little more dire again, including the issue of inadequacy. And she points out uh, an, an issue that I think is quite provocative and we need to think about more closely, and that is the diminishing role of the state in the provision of a public good like education. Uh, and this has been in a way uh, echoed by um, Elijah, who talks about, you know, how many of these problems that have been, that, that continue to ail us have actually historical and systemic roots. And that may be given uh, the context of the pandemic, now is really the time to um, confront you know, uh, some of these systemic weaknesses. Uh, given the unprecedented nature of the, of the crisis, also calls for bolder and more um, uh, braver, if you like, actions. Uh, and which means no, uh, an increased focus on those who have been marginalized, those who have been perennially socially excluded, you know, persons with disabilities, um, our brothers and sisters in the Muslim region, those who are geographically challenged, uh, many of our women and girls. Uh, so these are just some of the, our teachers, of course, who continue to uh, not receive that they're just Jew. Uh, see, these are some of the issues that we have seen before, but, you know, continue to uh, confront these problems. So while EDCOM 1 may have surfaced all of these issues, some of them continue to be applicable without, of course, denying that maybe some of them may not be so new and we need to look at the contemporary issues as well. So uh, I would like to end with that and I would like to really express my gratitude to our um, very um, insightful speakers, Ma'am Guevara, si Ma'am Flora, and um, our youthful guest, si Elijah. Maraming salamat po. Back to you, Lester. Thank you very much again, um, Ma'am Rakiza, no, for facilitating the second round of the roundtable discussion. Uh, I think um, nasa ano na po tayo, no? sa almost last part ng ating uh, program. Uh, probably we can have one or two questions po uh, para sa ating open forum. And I'd like to bring in Dr. Reginald Ubil again, sir, to facilitate po the open forum. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Lester. We, you know, we, we, I think we have two questions, right? That may that we can ask our our, our panelists or our, our discussants. Um, there's a question here from uh, um, maybe we can we can mention um, the question is how will you attract the best people to teach if the government couldn't provide the best salary for them? Right. So um, can, can maybe we can ask our, our panelists to to answer this. Can I answer? Yes, ma yes, Madam Secretary. Po. Alam mo, the greatest teacher that we ever had, isa lang ang chains ng clothes niya. Isa lang ang sandalias niya. Wala siyang PhD. Wala siyang sweldo. Wala siyang honorarium, pero tinatawag siyang teacher. At binago niya ang mundo. Ngayon, ang tanong, how do we attract the best humans to become 
the best teachers. Apat na oras natin yung pinag-usapan. Hindi na kailangan balikan natin yung pre-education, yung curriculum, etc., etc. Ang ang mahalaga niyan, yung sinasabi ko, isa din dapat ituturo, yun ang sinasabi ko palagi sa aming seminar na ang pagtuturo ay hindi isang hindi ka papasok sa pagtuturo dahil gusto mong yumaman. Hindi ka nagtuturo dahil uh, gusto mong malaking sweldo. Nagtuturo ka and sa aming surveys, lumalabas na halos more than 90% enjoy talaga sa pagtuturo. So ito yung ating recognize. Ito yung ating dapat silang i-attract natin. At saka kung i-compare natin, kasi mayroon akong pag-aaral, ayaw na ayaw ninyo yung mga knowledge-based, knowledge-based. Pero I ask uh, Inotech, for example, to conduct a study on motivation. Why do people want to become teachers? Kung i-compare mo sa siguro uh, dati kung bakit gusto maging teacher ang isang teacher at bakit gusto maging teacher ang isang teacher ngayon, eh talagang mayroong pagkakaiba. Kaya interesado ako sa curriculum, hindi lamang sa basic education curriculum, pero sa yung pre-entry curriculum kasi dapat doon talagang lalabas na o i-encourage na yung commitment na hindi ito uh, ordinaryong profesyon ang pagtuturo. Ang pagtuturo is suffering. Ang pagtuturo is sacrifice. Ang pagtuturo is pagmamahal sa ating mga bata. At sa kasabihin mo ay si Secretary Briones naghahanap ng imposible. There are no people like that. Of course, there are many humans who are like that. And we have to pick them out or we have to invest in basic education, in preparatory education para mailabas natin yung ganong klaseng ano. Uh, remember, Marivik, sa UPNC PAG, yung din namin dati, mayroon siyang libro na sinesirculate niya. Pinabasa niya sa lahat na faculty members. Yung The Joy of Teaching. And there's nothing in that book which talks about, you know, all the things that that, that we also talk about. Uh, kanina, I was listening to, to the opinions which were uh, expressed. Definitely, I agree with the, the position of, uh, of uh, <coughs> Dr. Guevara na how important the role of the local government sector uh, is. Pero itong ano, school governing boards, Dalawa ang chairman yan, co-chairman ang local government at ang Department of Education, uh, ang head ng school. So, may voice talaga ang local government kung gugustuhin ng local government official kasi co-chair siya. At saka, itong mga SEF funds, galing yan, alam naman natin lahat yan, galing yan sa real property tax na kinukulekta ng local governments mismo. kay hawak nila yung pera. So, pag magmimitingan na yan, theoretically, may say talaga sila dahil co-chair sila sa school board na yan. And as a matter of fact, talagang right now, we're working very, very closely with local governments, lalo na on the matter of the, uh, of the pandemic. Ngayon, yung at Sinasabi nating mga eskwelahan, et cetera, et cetera. Alam mo, Elijah, sinasabi mo yan, yung second year college ka pa, first year. Hanggang ngayon, it does not mean na hanggang ngayon, ganun pa rin. Na ganun pa rin ang, ang, ang uh, edukasyon. We have to recognize na mayroon naman pagbabago. At saka kung mayroong 1991, mayroong World Bank already at the time na nakautang tayo ng more than 700 million in just a period of how many years para sa mga loans on education to improve education, siguro mayroon namang mga pagbabago. Pero kung sasabihin natin na walang pagbabago, palagay ko, hindi naman yan uh, 
hindi naman yan fair. Mabuti na lang na binawi mo. Now, ngayon, on the matter of hazard pay, Flora, during the time of this administration, pinasa yung special hazard pay na batas. Ang sinasabi dito, aside from the special hazard pay of teachers who are assigned to hazardous places, kung mayroong classification, this is a recent law, kung mayroong classification ng isang local government na siya ay ECQ, entitled ang mga government employees ng special hazard pay. And that is up to the extent of 25% of their salary. So there is such a thing as a special hazard pay which is covered by law and for which government has to, uh, has to uh, come out with the, with the required funds. Nakikita ko dito, uh, ito rin kakulangan ng departamento na siguro hindi natin nasasabi lahat ng mga pagbabago sa edukasyon. Kasi nag-umpisa tayo na 1991 pinag-usapan natin. Ngayon, bumiyahe na tayo sa 2021. Eh, siguro hindi naman kami responsable sa kung ano man ang English, kung ano man ang state ng uh, knowledge ng mathematics ng mga adults at this time. Dahil as early as the 1980s, we learning na natin yan, remember, uh, uh, remember Marivik. We already warned that at the rate that we are using, we were paying the debt at the expense of education. In 20, 30 years time, the quality of our humans in the Philippines will reflect that kind of neglect. And we are seeing it now. So uh, yung, yung uh, sinasabi natin nangyayari ngayon, uh, resulta yan ng accumulation. It goes back even to the debt. Kasi ang sinasabi, sabi ng UNICEF at that time, in 30 to 40 years, the quality of, of, of the humans, uh, for example, sinabi din natin yan, Elijah na sa Freedom from Debt Coalition, Sinabi yan ang Freedom from Debt Coalition na the quality of the humans living in the Philippines of Filipinos will surely be, uh, will reflect the kind of neglect that we gave to education 30 years ago. And 1991, EDCOM is exactly 30 years ago. So uh, 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 ito yung mga, um, ano, sinasabi ko na nga, Uh, kakulangan din ito ng Department of Education na hindi nasasabi lahat yon Yung halimbawa, uh, yung mga sinasabing kakulangan ng... Ano, recently, ilang libo bang ano, uh, uh, laptops at saka cellphones at saka gadgets? Um, ang dinistribute ko personally, libo, 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 libo yan. At saka yung Last Mile Schools Program. So siguro dapat i ipamahagi yan para malalaman ng madlang people, ng publiko, na hindi naman yung 1991 is the same as 2021. And uh, at uh, dapat natin yan, as, as I said, um, uh, i-recognize. At saka yung SEF natin, ay, yung ating paggastos ng mga school boards, etc. Ang pinanggalingan yan ay taxes. Alam naman natin na bumaba yung ano, bumaba yung tax collections natin. Alam naman natin na nag-negative ang ating economy. Ngayon lang nag-umpisa ng pag-recover. Ngayon, sasabihin natin na, uh, at saka tama naman yung uh, warning ni Flora na uh, kailangan hindi profit-oriented. But I think you are also aware that only this year, more than 900 schools, private schools, closed. Dahil, hindi na hindi na makapagbay maka, makapag-aral yung mga bata dahil yung parents nila walang jobs it's related to the economy it's related also to jobs so kawing-kawing itong lahat ng mga ano at tama ka flora it's all about poverty uh, as well so um yung points din yo uh, very important kami rin may pagkukulang dahil hindi namin na share kung anong ginagawa at this time sa mga problema of 1991 na aming na ano na naabutan uh, yung 
yung resulta ng PISA na nakakasawa ng pabalik-balik, uh, alam naman natin na nag-umpisa na yung PISA in 2000. Kailan ba tayo umentra sa PISA? 2018. Sinong nag- nag-decide na mag- mag-join tayo sa PISA para makita natin yung mirror na malaman natin kung sino talaga ang beauty-beauty sa English at sa mathematics. Itong administrasyon na ito, itong sekretaryeng ito ang nag- nag-decide noon. Even as we knew that it is going to be political, even as we knew that the results were not going to be good, uh, I mean, will not be flattering at all. So, uh, ang, ang plea ko lang, let us put our hands together, let us share our experiences. There are good things happening out there, but there are also wonderful things happening inside, like our last mile schools programs. Like our increase in enrollment, lumaki ang enrollment sa public sector, bumaba ang sa private sector. And, and, and you know what is the, the cause of that. Ang dami ang laki ng migration ng mga uh, estudyante from the private schools to the public schools. Bakit nawala ng mga teachers ang private schools, nagsasara sila? Dahil nag-migrate sa public schools. Dahil... Siguro sabihin natin, kawawang-kawawa ang public school teacher. Pero siguro, kawawang-kawawa, mas kawawang-kawawa ang ordinaryo na 6,000, 8,000 a month na private school teacher uh, as well. So, uh, magtulungan tayo. Itong e- brigada eskwela natin, sinishift na natin, pinupivot natin sa reading. And, and I agree completely. I believe in the role of local governments dahil ngayon talagang kung todo tulungan sa local governments, not only in education but in COVID as well. Kasi uh, uh, ito yun ang krisis na uh, hinaharap natin. Uh, ang ang, ang kuli ko lang na uh, siguro mayroon tayong alam ng mga hindi magandang pangyayari. Maganda yung ipaalam ninyo yan sa amen. At marami namang nagsasabi niyan sa amin, inaaksyon na naman namin like yung matters of bullying, sexual harassment, and so on and so forth. I think ang record namin sa action sexual harassment is is quite uh, uh, credible. Ang record namin sa mga pa- webinars on mental health, ang nagpo-problema ng mental health ngayon, hindi lamang ang mga bata. Kasi pino- iniisip natin mental health sa mga bata. Ang mga adults, may mental health problems din. Sino bang hindi matatakot at this time? Ako nga. Nat- ako din, natatakot din ako sa pangyayari. Dahil di mo alam kung ano sunod na mangyayari. And we have to be helping each other out. So, let us join hands. Share our experiences. Share whatever insights that we have. Share our successes. Na ito, it worked. Maybe this will not work. Well, there are maybe worrisome things that are happening in in the de- education proper. There are also wonderful things that are happening in education proper, as there are equally wonderful things that are also happening uh, outside. And uh, as as I said, the greatest teacher that we ever had, wala naman yung sweldo, sa lang yung sapatos. Isa lang yung change of clothes. And he was not called your majesty, your royal highness, your professor, etc., etc., doctor, etc., etc. He was just called teacher. And most of our Nobel Prize winners are teachers. So the, there is something good to, to start on. We started with 1991. Nakita natin. Nakita na natin ang produkto ng 1991. You just listen to what uh, all of you are saying. That is 1991. And let us move on from there. As to trifocalization, we will go with whatever the lawmakers uh, decide. Yung sinasabi ko kasi uh, it's too messy and it's too emotional. We lost our Secretary of Education during that time. It's a... Ganon, ganon. And, and uh, 
uh, we have to to concentrate on what we identify as the the problems of education. So, uh, yun lang ang ano ko ang, ang suggestion ko. Allow us. We li- we will listen to you, but please listen to us also. Yun ang request ko, Maribit. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Secretary. Um, Ma'am Marivic? Yes. Um, um, maraming salamat, uh, Secretary Liling, for you know painstakingly taking the time to respond to many of the points raised in the chat box. Um, um, you pointed out quite rightfully you know that in this landscape, you know there are also there is also good news, eh? and uh, there are good things happening. And I think we owe it to ourselves, uh, to the education sector and the country, to you know to also tell it like it is. There are a lot of good things happening, and uh, you know we we need to affirm that because we also give we need to give ourselves a pat in the back. But having said that. We also know that, uh, as you have rightfully pointed out, and you have been so candid about, uh, marami pa ding problema. No? Uh, some of these problems are deeply rooted, are systemic, uh, are historical. Some are of more uh, have a more contemporary uh, nature to it. Uh, pero you know, many of these challenges have been exacerbated by the pandemic, um, and. Um, and as these challenges have point, been pointed out by our various stakeholders this afternoon, um, I'm glad we're having this very honest conversation, this back and forth, which will and should continue even after this forum, because there's nothing, nothing like an honest to goodness back and forth between and among stakeholders, between citizens and our leaders that we can make something good out of this country, that we can actually move forward. And this is actually what's missing in much of our public discourse and honest to goodness back and forth, you know, and, and that's some of the things that's one of the things that I really appreciate about this forum. Um, the role of the LGUs next time we in NCPAG and Social Watch should invite them. Thank you, Ma'am Nene, for pointing that out. Uh, they should be part of this hard conversation that we're having. Uh, as Secretary has pointed out, as we look at the future, if there's one thing that's certain, it's that the future is uncertain. And so now more than ever, we need to close ranks. We need to learn how to better listen to each other, not only with our minds, but also with our hearts and you know, with our beings so that you know, a shared understanding of what else the education sector in our country uh, can be better grasped within our lifetime. As uh, has been said, we need to learn and help each other. Um, um, And moving forward, we hope that this conversation that has been triggered by all of your passionate inputs and uh, uh, observations will continue in the coming weeks, months, and years ahead. With that, I'll turn the table to uh, Lester. Maraming salamat po. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rapiza and Dr. Last, ano ko lang, last observation ko lang. Whenever we, we initiate an initiative, like joining PISA, nobody joined PISA at all. Nobody reviewed EDCOM 1991 and, see, and find out whether it is. Then we get into trouble. Ngayon, we, 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 we initiated the, the review of EDCOM uh, we want to avoid that kind of trouble. We are initiating it because we want to work more and more with the different sectors of, of society. And as I said, we listen to you. You also listen to us. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Abriones. And again, thank you very much, Dr. Rapiza and Dr. Ogadan for moderating uh, our two rounds of roundtable discussions. And thank you also to our discussions. Uh, thank you very much for that very substantive and very insightful uh, discussions. No? 
we already sent the feedback form to our chat box. So the feedback form will also tell us if you need a certificate of participation. Muli po maraming salamat po sa mga participants natin na nandito sa loob ng Zoom at sa lahat po nang nanonood through, the, uh, through Facebook Live. And to officially end this very important public forum on the education sector, may I call on the Dean of the National College of Public Administration and Governance, University of the Philippines, Taliman. Please welcome Professor Dan A. Sagi. Before we close, I would like to reflect on our responsibility to make good use of our knowledge. There has been a long line of experts and practitioners who have taken education reform responsibility seriously and are working to make the education sector more responsive and effective to make our country a better place. This exercise is very important because education policy choices and decisions made by those in power affect and will affect nearly every aspect of daily life. Some policies are concerned with short-term issues, such as alleviating education concerns caused by economic leeches. Other policies deal with complex and intractable issues that occur in multiple locations and are carried out across generations. Policies also set some societal norms for behavior and more important should aim to improve the quality of life for the people. Additionally, we are aware that for formulating policies is difficult and more so is implementing them. Human capital development is a key element in our development strategy and has been the trigger behind various political reforms over the past years. Recent education reforms have sought to boost enrollment levels, graduation rates, and mean years of schooling in elementary and secondary education, and to improve the quality of higher education. We've introduced the Kindergarten Education Act of 2011, the 2013 Basic Education Act, and the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education. But as we observe, more effort is needed. In fact, we still must gather feedback on the new programs from respective sectors, analyze this data, and report back to the sectors the results of the analysis. Other concerns are still articulated. These include inadequate investment in education, unequal access in education, low achievement of students, high dropout rate, low salary of teachers, and life after school. Furthermore, COVID-19 have disrupted and have altered our education programs, but life must go on. This pandemic is a human tragedy, and our hearts go out to all those who have lost loved ones and to those putting themselves at risk to help and save others. It is important that we learn as many lessons as we can, especially on how the pandemic impinges on our educational system and how to adapt to overcome the current challenges that confront us. Some say that this pandemic highlights the needed changes today and the immediate future. While it is still early, pending deeper personal reflection, I am sure we have benefited in some way from this forum. Positions and points of view have been outlined and many messages have been delivered covering the wide range of spectrum as seen from the perspective of interest groups. As with all events like this forum, our minds have been assailed by a torrent of ideas, information, statistics, interpretations, and visions. And it will probably for a time before we can sift through them all and consolidate our own personal perspectives. There is plenty to re reflect upon. And if this 
in any way enhances our individual and collective contributions to meeting education challenges, they can, then we can say that there is still a good future for us. I hope you live here with a deep appreciation of your time and a strong commitment to put yourself and your organizations to good use to make a better country today and for succeeding generations. Finally, I wish to extend my deepest gratitude and appreciation to our esteemed legislators, education executives and stakeholders, our hosts and organizers, and our presenters and reactors for taking time off from your busy schedules to make this forum a success and to all our listeners for your interest. Again, marami pong salamat sa lahat. Best wishes, keep safe, at magandang hapon po. All right, thank you very much, Professor Dan Sagil, the Dean of the UP and CPAG. And before we really end the program, I request everyone, our speakers, our presenters, our reactors, discussants, moderators, and of course, our audience to kindly turn on your cameras for a group photo. Siyempre po, hindi mawawala at hindi po matatapos ang isang virtual conference or, or ang isang virtual event nang wala po tayong group photo. So our technical team will be taking the photo po. So please let us know kung kami po ba ay ngingiti na. We'll be flashing for the gallery, uh, the gallery view. Ready. All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. Smile po. Nakikita po tayo sa Facebook Live. All right, thank you very much po. Maraming maraming salamat po sa paggiti at pagsama sa aming uh, sa amin ngayong hapon or gabi na ito. And that actually concludes our virtual public forum. All right, again, that concludes our virtual public forum entitled Revisiting the EDCOM of 1991, Continuities and Discontinuities in Philippine education sector reform. This event is organized by the Center for Leadership, Citizenship, and Democracy, CLCD, of the National College of Public Administration and Governance in the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and the Social Watch Philippines in partnership with the Philippine Society for Public Administration, Junior Philippine Society for Public Administration, and the Education Futures Program. Again, thank you very much to our guest speakers and to all our active participants. Maraming salamat po. Stay safe and happy weekend. Ingat po tayong lahat.